Valerie. The pool boys, though, one of the pool boys, I think, does more of the, uh, do you know the rules? All right, good evening. Welcome to the Wednesday, May 15th, uh, 2019 workshop for the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Our agenda for this evening is to continue our review of the draft of the comprehensive plan. Uh, just a note for anybody who may be watching, um, Councillors Gabrielson and Caitlin Jordan are not able to be with us tonight. Um, Councillor Penny Jordan will be joining momentarily though, so, but seeing as we have a quorum, uh, we'll proceed as planned. So this is a continuation of the review that started last week. Um, we got about halfway through what we had planned to last week, so we've adjusted the agenda uh, to what you have before you here tonight. Um, chapters of the uh, plan that we'll be working through tonight include natural resources, agricultural and forest resources, marine resources, water resources, historic and archaeological resources, existing land use, recreation and open space, future land use plan, and regional coordination plan. We have another workshop scheduled for next Wednesday, the 22nd, at the same time, here in the Town Hall uh, Council Chambers, also to be broadcast live on Cape Elizabeth TV. Uh, so uh, anybody following along can do so there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our town planner, Maureen O'Meara, uh, to lead us through again. Um, if anybody has any questions before we get underway with the agenda, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll... Um, start with the first chapter after any remarks that you want to make, Maureen. Yeah, I, I'll jump right in. I just want to kind of briefly go over what we talked about last week, just to remind everyone the, the six points, that this is the plan of the committee, um, that the plan was assembled to also qualify for state certification. The plan is intended to be the legal foundation for the town's land use regulations. Um, the plan is organized um, to um, be the same chapters that are outlined in the state comprehensive plan rule and comprehensive plans by their nature have a lot of overlap. So again, we're gonna try to say that we should pick one place to say something and say it well in that one place instead of repeating things in multiple chapters. Uh, we are using comparison communities to a lesser extent tonight, but those comparison communities are Cumberland, Falmouth, Yarmouth, Scarborough, and South Portland. And, um, you know, data is what data is, but the uh, chapters we're going over tonight, actually, we have a lot uh, better data. Uh, some of the data is locally generated, so uh, we have a lot more control on how new it is. Um, and with that, I'd like to start in with the natural resources chapter. Um, the important thing in the natural resources chapter is if you look at the um, the pie chart that's on page 123, um, you will see that one of the most significant things about Cape Elizabeth is our resource protection districts reflect uh, to a great extent what we have for wetlands. And about one third of the town is wetlands in Cape Elizabeth. And I think that drives a lot of your regulations. Um, our open space, excuse me, our public opinion survey showed a very high public support for protecting natural resources. Um, I also wanted to point out that the town has its own wetland regulations, but we also um, compare ourselves to the inland fisheries and wildlife uh, wetland regulations. And if you look at that map, uh, it's on page 124, I've got it up there behind you. The key to the map is where you see colors other than green poking out. And the, the real message of this map is that pretty much every single thing that the state is identifying as a potential place where we should, looking at, we should be looking to protect, you're already protecting with your wetland regulations. So the, the town's already doing a lot of heavy lifting in that area. Um, the, town, the state's interested in vernal pools. We already protect them under resource protection regulations. Uh, we have a lot of plant and animal habitat, and those are already protected. I do want to point out on page 126, there's a heading called plant habitats, and that should really say animal habitats, because plant habitats comes a page later. Um, and then the only other thing is we will eventually be updating the federal floodplain maps once the federal government provides us with maps they want us to update. That's, that's all I have unless you want to move on to the uh, goals and recommendations. That sounds good. Okay. So under the goals and recommendations, 
We are basically talking about what we did last week, that we're retaining our current regulations. We feel that those are, are already meeting state goals, so uh, retaining our, our stringent resource protection regulations, our shoreland zoning, our floodplain management, our cluster development requirements. There is a recommendation that we look at our resource protection permit regulations, and they really should be updated. So it would really take what we have that was adopted in 1990 and focus a, focus them a little bit more on avoidance and minimization, which is in practice what happens when someone tries to get a resource protection permit. And then um, evolving environmental conditions, we're talking about the town should be poised to try to deal more with the invasive plants and animals that are occurring in part because of climate change, and also that we're encouraging residents to minimize pesticide use, but there's no recommendation that the town take formal action. Is there any discussion um, through the committee's work about going further on that last point? On pesticide, yeah. yes, there was discussion. <laughs> and the discussion was, no, we don't want to, the, the committee did not want to re recommend that the, that the town actually adopt regulations to restrict the use of pesticides. In particular, there was a point made that um, reasonable use of pesticides is important to the farming community and that the farming community is already regulated by the state in how they use their pesticides. How about for residential? Well, the, the thought is you're going to be regulating everybody. Um, there was no, there was some interest, but the full committee was not willing to recommend that there actually be something adopted. It's up I would just bring up as a point, I, I, I don't know, I didn't dig in before asking this question to see, uh, you know, what what the specific um, feedback that may have been received from the committee was. I've been hearing from more and more citizens, obviously, that are concerned about this. Um, so I just as a, as a point of reference, um, and I know some of the surrounding communities have taken a little bit more, um, you know, aggressive position around limiting um, pesticides. I, I, I would be curious to hear other counselors' opinion on this. Well, if I could, yep. before you recognize yep. uh, someone else. So the recommendation is that the town encourage residents to minimize pesticide use. I mean, if you want to do more, you could say that the town should evaluate steps to regulate pesticide use. That wouldn't commit the town to adopting something, but it would commit you to taking a, a harder look at it. Go ahead. I think that's a good idea. My question was similar to um, Jamie's, is how, how do we encourage residents? What does that really mean? What did the committee have an idea of what encourage means? Well, I mean, encourage, you, you know, you, I think it, it talked about taking advantage of programs such as the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District Healthy Yardscaping Initiative. So. Um, you know, you, there's, the recommendation is kind of an umbrella and you could do different things, but my guess it would really be more of a passive, elevate people's understanding, encourage them to take advantage of existing resources and hope they will do the right thing. Now, if the town, if you want to take it up a notch, um, you could say that the town should evaluate doing more. Um, I'm not recommending anything. It's just it's it's what you can it's what you want to do. Maureen, does this topic area? I, I know that most of the work of the conservation committee falls under, you know, trail maintenance, trail building, things like that. Is this something that's would be considered under their charge? Um, to, I, the the reason I'm at I, it feels like this is a topic that doesn't have a home, um, you know, it's, it, under some of our other committee structure. I haven't ever seen them work on something like this. Um, you're right, they tend to focus on open space and green belt trails. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they just got done with the dog ordinance. <laughs> mm -hmm. but again, that's up to you. Okay. Matt, did you want to add something? Uh, just in, in yeah. light of this conversation, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have lined up for August uh, council meeting a presentation from Friends of Casco Bay uh, to come and do a presentation specific to this area. I, uh, 
of speaking with them. I spoke with the uh, Cape Citizen last week uh, about her concerns relating to this and uh, have a contact at Friends of Casco Bay and she has a whole presentation that's ready for this. Um, and she had availability in, in August and seeing this in the conference plan, I thought that might be consistent with some of the uh, discussion that the council may need to have in, in, the, in the hopes of perhaps uh, elevating the understanding of residents that, of, of the impacts that it may have and, and letting them know about other options. So I thought it'd be timely uh, to do that this summer in advance of the fall or, or kind of in the sweet spot of the summer where folks are either mm -hmm. maintaining lawns or you know, applying pesticides or doing all of the above, as well as coming into the fall months when a lot of those other situations are applied. So I thought that might be a helpful presentation. Maureen, I'm inclined to go with what you're recommending um, with you know, the town investigating or exploring or whatever active language verb you want to use there that you think is appropriate. But um, put it in and you'll all have an opportunity right. to look at it again. Yep. Um, I think that it's appropriate for us to, um, I think, you know, by and large, we, on topics like this, we do a good job educating, you know, some of the things around recycling come to mind as comparable, but at, at some point there needs to be something that's a little bit more, um, a little bit more of a push. So um, that's my, my particular opinion, but. I, I agree. I think that we need to, um be a little more proactive with this and um, putting language in there and then having our uh, presentation and we can decide if we need a new committee or if it goes to the conservation committee. Uh, uh, related to that last point, uh, you all have heard me say before, uh, particularly when we were considering the formation of the energy committee, that ultimately I think the town would be well served by having a committee like exists in some other communities that's charged overall with issues of sustainability. This would fall yes. under, I think, a broader umbrella. Mm -hmm. So as we think long term about the needs of the town and, and the, the issues and topic areas that the council needs to be advised on, you know, that's something we might consider in, the, in, in how we structure committees and revisit at another time too. So any other questions or points that folks want to make on the natural resources, Councilor Randall? Um, just to respond briefly to your point, um, when we were discussing the energy um, committee in um, ordinance, we had a lot of discussions about the possibility of a sustainability committee um, and sort of talked to both committees about their thoughts. And their thoughts were that, at least for the short term, it was better to stay separate. But I agree with you that we should be moving in that direction. And I think maybe having a little bit stronger language might be just another push towards that. Thank you. Any other comments here? Okay, thanks, pretty straightforward. Okay, next chapter is the agriculture and forestry chapter. Uh, takeaways from this are that um, the town has a long history of agriculture. Uh, what we're seeing in the last 10 years is that there has been an overall decline in the amount of acreage that is uh, being put into agriculture, but there's actually um, either an increase or a change in the type of farming um, in that farmers are learning to be um, better at using less land and still making more revenue, um, not that they're making a lot. Um, we have a great information about the community gardens from Nancy Miles. Uh, we talked about farmland soils and preservation and there was some interest in requiring farm land that has prime farmland soils to be reserved for agriculture. Um, but there isn't really a good way to do that and still protect people's private property rights, one. And two, uh, most of the town's prime farmland soils are now sitting underneath some of the nicest neighborhoods in town. So uh, you would also have to ask how much, how effective something like that would be. Uh, we do have reference to the Future Open Space Preservation Committee where they looked at um, uh, some tax benefits for farming and they decided that they weren't really very effective and did not need to be enacted. Uh, the town is a big participant in the open space and agricultural state valuation programs. Uh, we do have a transfer development rights program in town and we have adopted a bonus 
uh, for transfer of development rights off of agricultural land, which is encouraging little, little bits to encourage the preservation of agricultural land. We do have uh, farm-friendly policies, uh, which were adapted as part of the last comprehensive plan. Uh, and you just should note that 28% of the land area of the town is currently enrolled in the tax programs that the state has to reduce valuation. So, any questions? Um, I meant to point out, given that she's not here, um, I am interested in moving along in the in the sequence that we have here. Um, but when Councillor Penny Jordan gets here, I will hold the option to revisit this in case she has any um, specific points that she wants to make on this section, as I know it's of particular relevance. But uh, I just want to throw that out there. Um, so are there questions or comments that anybody has before we review the recommendations? I would just say I, th I thought it was really interesting and beneficial probably for a number of people just to see the way the history of farming was laid out in the plan. So appreciated that and I found it both interesting and, and uh, educational. Not to the Cape Farm Alliance for that. Um, so the recommendations are promote agriculture with farm friendly policies and that is continue the current regulatory structure which is considered farm friendly, um, expand partnership opportunities between farmers and local governments such as serving local food in the schools, managing a solid waste composting program, um, educating farmers with lot owners and others about these state uh, valuation programs, and promote community gardens and agriculture related programs in the public school system. Anybody have any questions on that? On that last point about the schools, I know at one point there was talk about um, trying to develop a greenhouse at the schools. Do you know where that went or where that stands? At this point, I don't think it's been moving forward. Yeah. Okay. I haven't heard. I haven't heard much about it for a couple of years. Okay. I, I believe they're still working on that and they're raising funds for mm -hmm. it. So they were talking about um, $300,000 is needed for that wow. program. So um, on election day, there was a young woman there from uh, <coughs> Cape Elizabeth High School who had flyers about it and was taking donations for the program. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other comments here? Matt, do you want anything? No, sir. Nope. I, I thought you were getting ready to say something. No, I just fighting a cough, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Sounds good. Marine Resources. So the big news about the marine resources chapter, if anyone looked at the one in the current plan, it was thin, um, it was not, there wasn't a ton of information on it because someone who didn't know much about marine resources wrote it. Um, the current chapter was prepared by the Harbors Committee and we asked them in addition to their work to, to put this information together. So I find it, I would recommend it's a sea change improvement because you've got a lot of information from people who work. I saw that, you saw that? There you go. You're welcome. So um, big part is, is lots of this is the Harbors Committee report which the council has already received. Um, you know, highlights are sharing the Harbor Master with the town of Scarborough, um, notes on the mooring numbers. Um, you know, we, we have some issues with some record keeping, some discontinuance of moorings without reporting. So uh, when you look at those numbers, be aware, don't get, don't get too deep into numbers that have small changes because um, we're all a little concerned they're not perfect. Um, same with some of the licenses uh, in the Harbor Committee is the one that had to explore this. Apparently the uh, Department of Marine Resources in the state changed uh, software programs mid-year and half of the year of the licenses was maybe not completely captured. So despite the best efforts of the, of the Harbors Committee to get that best information, we still have a caveat on that. Um, the Kettle Cove improvements, as you know, the town is about to apply for a grant to move ahead with the public access launch. And the, the last thing is this whole idea of potentially um, the town having some kind of shellfish committee. And the thing is there are more aquaculture licenses being acquired 
um, we didn't have enough time to really dig into that issue. And the, the only thing that's being suggested here is that, you know, maybe the town should look into, is there a benefit for there to be a little bit more local regulation that would promote um, commercial fishing in the Cape Elizabeth area? So there isn't a recommendation to create a committee. There's, there's a recommendation to, to look at it. What would that look like, do you think? The, not the committee, the, like what types of regulations? Well, there's, there's a bunch of... Um, uh, aquaculture licenses that are starting to come out and there are certain advantages if you have some regulations for streamlining the review um, and I again that's pretty much all I know um, but it might be worth the town's while to just kind of look a little bit further into it would it make sense for the town to be a little bit more proactive in regulating that or do we want to say you know it's being handled by the state we're good with that for now Okay. Um, I have a question on the moorings. Yes. Do you know? Um, do you know what's required to maintain an active mooring? So, so my my question is not. I guess what I've anecdotally observed is a bunch of empty moorings, particularly in a couple of places that I frequent. But um, so somebody may maybe paying for it and maintaining it, but there's no boat on it ever. And my my deeper understanding of it is having recently worked on the outhaul regulations with the ordinance committee. And, you know, I think it really depends on how active your harbor master is. Because the harbor master is supposed to be keeping track of making sure those are annually inspected. And your ordinance says that it, I think if it's not being used by July 4th, or something along there that they're supposed to notify the harbor master. And if there's a concern about that, it might be better to ask the current harbor master to provide the council with a report, a status report of what's new. Because I know you've also just changed harbor masters again. Uh, Scarborough had a new person come in. And okay. I just didn't know if you needed to basically be actively using it in order to retain the I think the ordinance implies that but I'm I don't I don't know what the actual custom and practice is mm -hmm. okay um, other questions from anybody uh, before we review the individual recommendations <coughs> okay so these recommendations are almost exclusively coming out of the harbors report, which the council has already seen. Um, it talks about developing that public use ramp so we can take pressure off of the commercial ramp. It talks about getting a, 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 a arranging for uh, an easement from the state over that property. Um, those are the, the bulk of the recommendations. It talks about keeping the harbor master shared with the town of Scarborough. We're experiencing a level of professional now that we haven't had in the past, um, incorporate the Cape Elizabeth sea level rise vulnerability assessment into our studies of future facilities, um, and I think that kind of summarizes it. Um. Chris, I remember back at the time that we were reviewing the Harbors Committee work, you had some questions about um, expansion of access. Was there anything that you thought needed to be represented here to, to address that? or Nothing in particular. Okay. Any other questions from anybody on the recommendations? As Maureen said, I mean, they're mostly things that we've seen already from the specific recommendations from the Harvard Committee, but... I just have one, one yep. question. Um, on recommendation number 54, um, obtained from the state of Maine an easement for the uninterrupted use um, of the boat cove by the town's commercial fishermen. We've heard uh, a presentation on that and talk about that. Is that some, do we have uh, personnel to do that? Would that be our attorneys doing that? How is that gonna work, Matt? Mostly through conversations with the state, uh, which we've been ongoing. Uh, it's just a question of moving that forward. Uh, it may be a question of not having an easement, but a memorandum of understanding, maybe where the state is more willing to go to, but uh, all balls are in the air uh, at the present time, but we have been discussing it with them. 
try to try and move that forward. Also with the uh, the harbors uh, access planning grant, uh, kind of trying to attack okay. the whole the whole point uh, down there at the same time. Okay, just curious how um, how we're planning to obtain that. Okay. Is the state not as interested in an easement, or they're not as interested in the in the phrase easement as okay. much as they are like long term agreements. Uh, I know it sounds funny. It's a fine point, but well, no. I mean, we I mean we use the same language for you know when we're doing trail planning. Yeah. Um, I forget the the very low license, beginning license agreement. Yeah. You know, basically. So, so is that so kind of what they're talking about? Similar to that. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be more along along okay. those lines. Um, okay. Penny, make yourself comfortable. We're moving along swiftly. That's oh, yes, because I wasn't here. <laughs> I did. Say, we're we're on the we're on the marine resources section. Um, just going through the re the review of the recommendations on that. Okay. And I did say though that I'd be happy to, to hit the rewind button um, and go back to the agricultural section um, if you had any particular points you wanted to make on that. Um, um, I do, but I can't make it. Um, I was trying to make it tangible before I, I, uh, I got here, okay. and um, and so I started to do a little bit of research, okay. and um, and so I, I may I may loop back to that at some point, but it it is about what other towns like in Vermont, New Hampshire, um, and um, other parts of the country are doing to. Uh, increase the, um, I would say, traffic through the farms. And it's not about farmers markets, it's about really that visibility, which is a lot of what Cape Farm Alliance does, but I know that there are towns that are really uh, grabbing on to it and trying to create that visibility for their farms. So I'm trying to do some research so I can loop back to it so that I can bring it forward as we okay. uh, delve a little bit more into it. Fair enough. Does anybody else have any questions or comments on the recommendations of the marine resources then? All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, go ahead. I just, um, based on that discussion about the easement and the language, should we just keep the language in the plan as obtain an easement? Um, or should we change that Maybe to easement or similar uh, right of access or something? Or? Uh, or, yep. okay. or yeah. a, a step ahead as usual. Yeah. No, 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 I'm just trying to keep up. Okay. Water resources. Water. So the water resources chapter, if you looked at it, you saw a lot of maps with a lot of green. Um, the focus of the water resources chapter is to keep the current strict regulations. Uh, we do have a map that shows we have two drainage areas. The interesting thing about the map is you'll see the yellow line. Um, on the right is one drainage area. On the left is the other drainage area. The other thing I want to point out is these cute little buckets here. So this one right here that is right on the Cape South Portland line and this one here down at Peoples Cove, those are municipal wastewater outfalls. And then this one here that's at Fort Williams Park, potential, it's specifically at um, the museum at, two, at, at Portland Headlight, and this is a private property owner at um, Pond Cove. Those are licensed overboard discharges. So the, the thing here is these are legal discharges into the waters of the Atlantic, and there are, I, I spent a lot of time reviewing those permits. They have very strict rules. Um, there doesn't seem a, to be a lot of opportunity to discontinue those, especially the two wastewater. Those are our, those are our two sewer treatment plants, but they do have an impact on water quality. So you just kind of kind of keep them in mind as, as we go ahead. So uh, we went through all the classifications. Um, some of the waters of the state um, around the town are not classified um, class A because of those wastewater outfalls. Um, but overall, the classifications that we have are in pretty good shape. Um, what I wanted you to understand is once we go through all of these and you see one of these maps, 
Um, the idea with this map is to look at the resource we're talking about. So for example, in this one, we're talking about Gray Pond and to look where there is color around the resource. So every map where you see lots of colors <laughs> surrounding the resource is an indication that it's already protected. So here you've got uh, wetland regulations, you have open space ownership, you have shoreland zoning protection. And as you go through those maps for each of the water bodies, you'll see that, the, that each one of them is just buried in different colors. And so the message is that this is the benefit of the strict regulations that you have, that all your important water bodies are fairly well protected already. Uh, let's see, I think the only other thing you should know about is we do have this community fee utilization program for Trout Brook. Um, Trout Brook is identified by the state as an urban impaired watershed because it's not meeting its water quality classifications. That means that we've created a management, for, management plan for it. Uh, Trout Brook and our growth areas tend to overlap, which is not unusual since it's an urban impaired watershed and you would think that your growth areas would be in a more urbanized area. What that means is that when a development happens in the urban impaired watershed, instead of looking for a project to treat stuff, uh, the developer provides the town with a fee and we are then using that money to improve the watershed. So we have set up this system, it's being supervised by the state but it's already in place. Any questions? Not on that. Um, I, I did have a question about, um, and I'm not sure if this is the section to ad uh, address it, but um, a distinction for stormwater drainage and that as an issue. And just I know, um, particularly in the last several years with storms of greater intensity, that has become you know, a greater concern specifically to the Public Works Department about how to manage that and how to manage the impact of that. Is that something? We tried to put the stormwater stuff in the public facilities chapter. Okay. Um, and you know, the chapter basically says that we have stormwater infrastructure and we're trying to manage appropriately and um, we're part of this MS4 program. There's a federal permitting program. So the town is actually required to map its stormwater, to test, to sweep the roads. And you're, I think you're starting your fourth five-year permit and the town is in good standing so far with the way it's managing its stormwater. The other interesting thing is you all know that you just finished that culvert report and that's another piece of the stormwater puzzle. Okay. Yep, go ahead. We are currently planning for, uh, uh, we met was it, uh, a week and a half ago with uh, Christy Rabaska, who's our paid consultant for the town for our MS4 uh, anticipated audit, which should be coming at some point in this coming year. So mm -hmm. uh, staff is prepared. We, we seem to be in very good shape as far as uh, our current practices uh, so and, and as well as our planning and training for the audit uh, that's upcoming. So we have a high level of confidence on that as well as some of the infrastructure improvements that the town's put in. You know, the, uh, the CSO work that was done in Ottawa yep. Road area was a, is a really, you know, that shows the town's commitment that it's, that it's come to as far as stormwater and, and trying to take care of that in an appropriate manner. So uh, we are planning ahead for that audit because we are, as Maureen said, we're on our Going into our, our fourth, fifth year, uh, five year uh, period of time, we're, all, we're, uh, we're also in year six of the last five year period and we haven't been audited yet. So uh, mm -hmm. that's why we're anticipating one uh, in the short, short term. Okay. Should we move on to the recommendations? Yes. So um, you have. Uh, a goal here to uh, promote compliance with existing water quality requirements, so maintain compliance with the overboard discharge and wastewater discharge permitting, and, and like I said, it's a pretty hefty, I mean, I reviewed the town's permitting, it's a pretty hefty lift. There's a lot of requirements, there's testing that's required, and so just keeping track of that permitting and complying with those requirements, I think, is something the town should 
uh, be proud of, and also it does address the water quality. And then there's this issue with potentially having uh, a water quality issue that's been identified in uh, the Spurwink River. We think it's more coming from Scarborough, but it would be good to partner with them as they get more data available. Um, we partner with the City of South Portland on the Trout Brook Management Plan. And then there's uh, number 67, and we have this uh, major water wetland complex at Elwife Brook, Peebles Cove. Um, the committee recommended that there be a comprehensive assessment of the Elwife Brook Peebles Cove Water Complex. The assessment should include water quality testing of the brook, evaluation of siltation impacts on the brook, and more in-depth assessment of the Peebles Cove water quality, evaluation of the alewives migration, and an infrastructure assessment of the existing dam. Uh, it's not in the comprehensive plan, but we did provide the committee after they inquired with aerial photos showing the condition of Alewife Brook over a period of time and the, the photos were a little disturbing. They showed a lot of siltation. So this is a, a kind of a major lift and if this is in the comprehensive plan, it, it, makes a, it, it sets the town up for potentially looking for grant money to do that assessment. The Casco Bay Estuary Project is very interested in stuff like this. So um, that, that's where I see that going. <laughs> What's involved in remediation for that kind of stuff once it's identified? That's a good question. And that, that's what we would have to look at. But yeah. there, there is an issue with the dam there. I had to call the state. The state said the dam is owned by the property it's on. Um, I've been out there as part of other third party assessments. Um, the dam needs some attention. Uh, if, if it's not properly maintained, it becomes a barrier for alewife migration. And so you, you start to say, well, why don't we have alewives returning to Great Pond? And it's like, because they can't get through the rocks of the dam. Okay. Any questions from anybody? Okay. Uh, the last two. Uh, last, uh, sorry, um, yeah. as far as a recommendation goes on 67, um, whom would it be that we would task with that assessment? Our town engineers or? Um, the assessment, I, I mean, I, I don't remember who we tasked that with. If you want to let me hold That's up okay. my number 67. I think the first group that it's assigned to is the town council. Okay. So you, you would be the first people to assign that. But um, I mean, again, the way I would do it is I would wait for an opportunity to uh, fund it with partial grant funding. Yeah. Okay. And then you have this uh, water quality monitoring program recommendation. Um, we don't really have any funding assigned to that right now. So that, that does have a cost. And then assign names to significant unnamed water bodies, ironically, was in the last comprehensive plan and still has not been done. So at least that one wouldn't necessarily be costly. Go ahead. And who would we assign that task to? Again, it probably would be the Conservation Committee. Okay. 68 was one that struck me as an opportunity for regional collaboration as well. I imagine that on a small scale, with a fair, I mean, you've identified a number, the committee's identified a number of, you know, different water bodies in town and things like that, but still, in totality, it's a relatively small number, but as there's interconnectedness with some of them, there may be some opportunity. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, the Casco Bay Estuary Project is doing um, a couple of spots on the Cape Elizabeth coast, but the inland water bodies, they're not, they're not significant at a statewide level. Yeah. And so they're not getting any kind of attention. Pretty much the only time water quality testing has been done for those is when the town has said, okay, it's time for us to go in there and do it. And, right. and I think uh, just recently the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust um, organized a water, a volunteer session with uh, Great Pond. But, you know, what you, the best you can do is to get some volunteers who are willing to go and collect the water. You still have to take them to the testing facility, and you got to pay for that. Yeah. And, well, you know. I, that, and that's the point that I'm saying that, you know, if South Portland and Scarborough or anybody else was saying, oh, this is something that we're considering or think we should be doing too, that maybe if we band together on that kind of stuff, that would be a more efficient way to do that. So, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. 
Any questions on the recommendations? Great. So the next chapter is the historic and archeological resources. Um, we had input from the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society. Uh, the state has recommended to, uh, that the town do a survey of all our historic and potentially prehistoric archeological resources. Um, that has a lot of potential cost. The committee did not, in the end, recommend that that be done. The state's um, recommended that as part of, to align with their It's a generic process, recommendation. Okay. Yeah, it's, the, it's a nice thing okay. to do. <laughs> Um, we have in potentially 16 prehistoric historic sites. We have seven national register sites. We have potentially 10 more national register sites. Um, we did include in this chapter uh, some experience with a prehistoric survey that we did prior to installing the Pollock Brook Bridge, and so some of that information is in here. Um, but basically, the recommendation is to focus on uh, expansion opportunities at Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society as for a new home and to retain the existing local provisions that require evaluation of archeological resources whenever we have new development. Any questions on the material? I have one question. Um, on page 192, uh, line 24, um, basically line 22, you're saying that um, the town's unwilling to restrict private property rights by mandating preservation of historic buildings. Um, and they're advocating property owners do the right thing. Is, is that something that we can create incentives for people? Um, is there something that we can do, or is it something we just say we'd like you to do the right thing? Do we have any um, history on that? There, well, I have history, and it's 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 not a happy history. Um, there was an effort by the town to adopt historic preservation regulations, and in the end, not only did we not adopt the regulations that we were looking at, but we rolled back what we already had. So little concerned about going after it again. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of our challenges the last time we looked at this is that we were looking at significant structures and what we were hearing is it's really more valuable to look at areas that are historic rather than just individual structures. But I, I'm not thinking that it would be that much more supported if we actually looked at whole chunks of the town and said, ooh, let's, let's protect those historic resources there. I mean, and I would tie this to what you're gonna see in a few chapters with you know, the increase in the number of teardowns in the town, mm -hmm. which is supported. Questions on this? Next, flying along. So um, we're now to my favorite chapter, the existing land use chapter. Uh, and, and it's my favorite because I had control over most of the data in it and it really has a very interesting story to tell uh, in what's been happening in the town over the last uh, 10 and 20 years. So um, we've got this zoning map and the, what, the, the, what you ought to get out of the zoning map is 50% of the town is in the Residence A district, which is a low density residential district. And then we've got 30% of the town in resource protection and you don't have a lot left. Uh, so you've got a small RB district that's just 7% of the town and that's where you're hoping to put most of your growth and you've got an RC district that's just a little bit larger at 9% of the town where most of the development of the town already is. Um, so one of the struggles uh, folks have is understanding um, growth and um, this chart which I have behind you which is also on page 190. 
nine is a representation of what happened with building permits from 1997 to 2006, and then we have the 2007 comprehensive plan, and then what happened with building permits from 2008 to 2017. And the message here is that, first of all, development fluctuates. Um, so if you feel like it's going too fast now, don't worry, it'll slow down. And if you feel like it's really too slow, it's probably going to speed up at some point. So this line will show you that um, things go up and things go down. What we had in the prior 10 years was an average of 24 homes a year built. Um, and then in the most recent 10-year period, which is 2008 to 2017, we had an average of 16 homes built. So you can see that there was a drop if you look at it on an annual basis, of eight homes a year. So absolutely there has been less development in Cape Elizabeth in the last 10 years than there was in the prior 10 years. And, and that, that's an important takeaway. Um, one of the things, you know, people say, well, we had the 2008 recession. In any 10-year period, you're probably going to find a boom period and a bust period. So um, this is what those numbers look like. It's important to look at these because then we need to think about where do we think development is going to be in the next 10 years? And we need to be clear that we're not promoting development. We're saying that you have to come up with a projection. The state requires that. And you come up with your projection and you plan for it. And if you don't have as much growth as you projected, that's okay. And if you had a little more growth than what you projected, you're probably still okay. But it gives you um, a, a place to, to where to start from. So the first piece is development is slowing down. Um, how much is it slowing down? What the committee came up with is that if growth dropped by eight units a year in these two 10-year periods, um, we said it'll probably drop by another 50%. So we were projecting that going forward, we would project 12 units a year over the next 10-year period, and that was the amount of growth we should be expecting. Well, that's not good. Um, and that is something that the, the council needs to think about. Is that the right number? Are we in the right place? Just to give you a, a point of reference, uh, talk to the code enforcement officer. And as of last July 1, 2018 to present, so we're almost through a, a fiscal year, we've had 21 new dwelling unit permits issued. But again, we may be at the top of one of those peaks and not one of the bottoms. Maureen, this ties back to a question I had yeah. when we met last week, um, and there's reference to it on page 199, um, line 8, um, about um, replacements for existing structures. Yes. Is there anything you can point me to, or was there discussion amongst the committee about that dynamic as an impact on this section. In the last, in the 2007 comprehensive plan, one of the things you're supposed to look at is trends. And we identified in the 2007 plan that one of the trends was this trend of, of teardowns. And the, the council at that point said, we don't have a problem with that. We think it, it's investment in the neighborhood, go for it. And in this last 10 year period, we're seeing that absolutely right. We went from about, I think, 10 teardowns in that last 10 year period to 34 in this 10 year period. There was no, if, if there was any trend, it would be that properties on the water tend to be torn down more often. Um, there was no other real trend on that. And if you're thinking about growth as accommodating new units, we treated that as something you probably don't need to factor in. That if, you're, if you've got a house, you're tearing it down, you're putting in a new house, it's not really new growth, it's replacement. If the council wants to look at it as an issue, I guess you could. I mean, there are issues you could think about. Uh, I know in some other states and some other uh, cities, their big concern has been with how you tear down this house and you get this house built. Um, and, there, and I know that in the 1990s, this town talked about that and should we be concerned? And the feeling at that time was no. So if that's where you're going. No, it's actually, I'm, I'm going more towards the notion of um, 
And I agree, I agree with you. The obvious point is that you're replacing stock, you're not adding to it, so net, net it's neutral. Um, my bigger point was, um, you know, following up on what I was saying last time, in the, the spread of age of homes in town, I'm, I'm curious if we're, regardless of the economy, more likely to see continued um, upward trend in this area of teardowns simply because, you know, some of the homes are becoming to the point where it's more it, it's more viable to replace than it is to try and renovate. So I have to say that. Um, and then you know, in turn, and, there's a there's a valuation change, obviously. That I mean, you know, honestly, if town, you're but. if you're interested in that, we could pull out the data on the 34 teardowns and look at the age of the structure. My sense anecdotally in the conversations around the office is that all of these structures were ha ha inhabited, inhabited before they were torn down. Right. So we they weren't torn down because they just, were derelict right. structures. Um, in one case, they tore the structure down and rebuilt exactly the same structure. Um, in a lot of cases, we're, you know, we're seeing some of these waterfront structures where they're coming down and a lot, much larger structure is going up. We're seeing structures come down that don't seem that old. Hmm. Again, if you want more data on that, we, we, could, we could dig into it somewhere. Yeah. I know, I mean, there's certainly, and you just referenced the number that, you know, a small house, the new house got a lot bigger, particularly in the water area. But I mean, I don't think the problem you're describing and being fearful of in the 90s of sort of the McMansion phenomenon doesn't really appear to have happened or materialized as best as I can tell. Or at least like I've certainly seen in other communities, I'll, I'll say that. That's just my perspective on it, but go ahead, Matt. Yeah, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, yeah. Uh, yeah, the experience that I've in my, in my yeah. prior career uh, has been that on, uh, on your interior lots, you're not finding that as much as you say, like in, like, like greater Boston suburbs, like Newton or so, you'll find infill where they're, they are taking down an older house and, and replacing it with a brand new one. What we've found here has been investment in the older housing stock, like in the northern part of town, thinking of like the, uh, the cottage farms area, you're finding a lot of investment into the buildings themselves because they're quite honestly very well built homes. Right. Uh, great structure, whereas some of the stock that was built in the 70s or you know, post or Vietnam era to, to current, you find those replaced a lot more. Uh, some of that due to the materials that the homes were built of, due to the energy shocks and, and, and things that have taken place and changes in material, and and just desires to yeah increase the the home's value based on what modern society may want. So right. you find those replaced a lot more, and then the water is just a whole other entity all all together. Where you can find a home that may have been built within the past ten years that could that could be replaced completely. So. Uh, the water is a whole other element of the discussion, but the interior hasn't found it as much. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I want to point out the, there's a couple of questions the state really requires us to look at, and I found them particularly interesting. So on page 201, we have uh, we're housing those 164 homes, where they, where the 160 homes, where they occurred in Cape Elizabeth over the past 10 years. And what we see is, what you want to see is that most of your growth is going into your growth areas. So you can see in this chart that 31%, that blue on the bottom, is the RB district. So that's the place where we said we think growth should go. We had another 26% in the RC. That's infill areas. That's another place where we said that's where we want growth to go. We had a chunk in the town center district. Um, and then we had 38% in the RA district, and you'll probably remember a few minutes ago I said that's our rural area. So that's where you want less growth to happen. And, dis and, and our regulations are doing a good job in pushing most of the growth towards the growth areas, but we still have a significant chunk that's ending up in the residence A district. Um, so that's gonna become more important in a few minutes. Um, the next pie chart, uh, we talk about how these lots are getting developed. And uh, most of them are going into new subdivisions. And I would say that's a good thing because we have very strict subdivision regulations. We require open space to be dedicated. We require open space impact fees. So 61, yes, I see. Uh, I, I, I got to jump on that one. Uh, so I just want to reiterate what you just said. If we're building a new subdivision, 
there's a requirement that we set aside open space. There's a recognition that we, we have evolved as a society and recognize that a healthy living environment, you set aside open space. You, th you think that's fair? Yeah. Um, I, I think the town policy has said very strongly that it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, so obviously that's not how old subdivisions were laid out. So when you look at the older subdivisions, they don't have that uh, designated open space. Instead, that's been filled by uh, basically the, the various undersized non-conforming lots. They've in effect served that purpose. So on one hand, we recognize if you want to build a new subdivision, you have to set aside this open space. On the other hand, the conversation last week was, oh, but in these old, old subdivisions, we're going to let you fill that in. And I just wanted to flag this sentence because I do like this sentence right below the housing subdivision pie chart. Any trend to increase lot splits outside of the subdivision re review process should be concerning. So I just really like that sentence and I agree with that sentence. And I, I'm glad you like it, but I, I don't think you mean, it means what you think it means. <laughs> it, I, I would disagree. And, and, I'd say and, what it means. Uh, and that's fine. Yep. So, cause I'm going to, I'm going to go right back into the infill lots. And in, in this slide, what I did is I called a certain number of our subdivisions, modern subdivisions. And basically, you know, said, I think it was 1985 or, and later, and I can't remember remember, I've, I listed which ones they were. So the old subdivisions um, are the other subdivisions. It's like everything before we had modern subdivision review, those are the infill lots that we're talking about. And 18% of our development went on what we would call those old subdivision infill lots. And then 21% went on the individual lots. That's when someone owns more land than they need for their minimum lot size and they hack off a piece of property. And that's the one you should be most concerned about because it has no review. It's just, you know, minimum lot size, minimum frontage. And the 18% is in theory, if you believe in infill de development, and we're acknowledging that everyone here does, that um, those are also reasonable, but if 18% of your development went on your infill lots, it suggests there's not that many infill lots left. Mm -hmm. So the ability to absorb development on the infill lots is probably a lot less. Um, you've got um, that you've, some of your capacity and your growth areas has been absorbed, so there's less land available. And the expectation is that's going to put more pressure on your RA district. Mm -hmm. And, I, okay, go for it. So no, I'm building up, but go for it. So, uh, did the, uh, we can agree, so people often dispute this. This is something that goes back and forth. Um, Obviously, we do have to have a growth management program as part of our comp plan. That's, that it's required by the state, is that fair? Um, the talk is always about, we need to figure out where we're gonna divert this growth in order to have it control planned growth, which totally makes sense. Um, but we can agree that one way we can meet our obligations is by entering into an interlocal agreement with a neighboring community and divert the growth, say, into Mill Creek, where, frankly, as, as I look around, like, we don't have to accommodate any growth in the RA district, the RAB district, or the RAC district. We can enter into an interlocal agreement with South Portland, focus on Mill Creek. They had a plan where basically we're gonna put in a couple low rises, we're gonna have higher density, we can have bus service, we can have all of this infrastructure and all of these benefits, rather than this, continued suburban sprawl into Cape Elizabeth. Is that an option? And if so, did the Comprehensive Plan Committee look into it? Yeah, the, the challenge with that is if you're in a place like Portland, Oregon, where they have growth boundaries, and if you're on this side of the line, you can develop, and if you're on this side of the line, you can't, you have a, you have a proactive yes or no, you can develop. In Cape Elizabeth, you have a react, reactionary type program where people's property rights still allow them to develop even if they're in the RA district. So even if the town were, were able to enter an agreement with South Portland that you know they're going to have our development, we're not going to be able to force the private property owners in Cape Elizabeth to send their development that way. We, I know of no other than coming up with a very 
restrictive program, and you can decide, not me, whether that has political support. So, but we can agree then that in effect neuters the argument for why we should allow the infill development on the older lots and the older subdivisions, because there's no longer then the justification that it's necessary in order to reduce the pressure that's occurring on the RA district, because we can instead simply say, well, we have an interlocal agreement, we're gonna shift that pressure over to South Portland rather than pushing it onto the RA district or these subdivisions. I, I would suggest that um, there is no way that people are gonna think that living in South Portland is the same as living in Cape Elizabeth. There's a market for that, and that I think there are people who are willing to live in the RB district and the RC district in Cape Elizabeth rather than the RA district, but they're not going to see trading that for South Portland as an equivalent trade. I agree. Um, I think that's a little bit of a straw man argument, no offense, because the question is do we need to be relaxing or opening new areas for development in order to meet the growth that is expected to occur? And my answer is no because we can enter into an interlocal agreement with South Portland and have them absorb it. And from a larger regional planning uh, viewpoint, it makes far more sense to build up concentrated development in Mill Creek than it does for us to relax our development restrictions in Cape Elizabeth in order to allow development in the pre-existing sub yeah. subdivisions. And, and Councillor, it's, yep. it's not that the state is requiring us to absorb a certain X amount of development. They're telling the town, figure out how much you think you got coming down the road and plan for it. And unless you're willing to tell property owners in the RA district you are not allowed to develop your property, I just don't understand how the interlocal agreement is going to function. So what is, uh, can you uh, describe for me the justification then for relaxing development in the RC district? Because so, I understand your point about the RA district. But. So, okay, so, and I'm glad because that's where I was going. Great. <laughs> um, and it's, and I would, I would contest the word relax. I would um, use the word shift. And the question for the council, and it's not something that you have to do, but the reality is uh, we know, we're estimating we have 120 new dwelling units coming down the road in the next 10 years. So we can argue maybe it's 100, maybe it's 150, but there's almost definitely going to be some development happening in the town. And if we put it in the RA district, it ends up using approximately three times as much area as you would end up using if it was in the RB or the RC. So that that is the main thing that you can say, you know, if we have if we have exactly the same amount of development distributed in the same districts as we just had, um, you're going to use up more land in the RA. That's why you may want to consider designating another piece of the RA as an RB district because you can allow much more development on a much smaller amount of property. So again, I apologize. I, uh, That's fine. I don't mean for this to come across as inflammatory. I'm doing my best to... Um, that, that's a false choice, because you're basically saying there's gonna be 160 units of development. They have to be somewhere, in that if we take the RC district off the table, there will still be 160, and it's all gonna happen in the RA. I, I would say no. Instead, if there's that much, you're, you're assuming there's a demand of 160 to come into Cape Elizabeth, and that if those come off, it must all shift to the RA. That development that's gonna happen in the RA is gonna happen whether or not the RC is open, I would argue. And instead, people are looking regionally, and again, we can shift it to South Portland where it makes more sense, where we can have bus service, where we can have infrastructure, rather than putting it in Cape Elizabeth. And I just also wanted to flag earlier in the chapter, um, there's the wonderful table that notes that if you want to put in multi-unit buildings in the RC district, it requires five acres if you want to put in a new one. But one of the proposals talks about taking pre-existing houses and allowing people to put in multi-unit buildings in effect um, in the pre-existing subdivisions in Cape Elizabeth. So on one hand, if you want to build a new subdivision, we're saying, uh-uh, not unless you have at least five acres, but at the same time earlier in this comp plan, we're saying, oh, that limitation, it, it doesn't apply. We're, we're going to let you put it in on an old pre-existing building. As I said, and I will continue to say with my last breath, this is the <laughs> committee's plan. Yep. 
Um, I think that recommendation, and I'm, I'm looking to Penny, because she was in the room, um, I think it was in part a reaction to seeing the trees cut down for the construction of Maxwell Woods and the feeling that you know, everybody would be so much happier if we could have just put that development in a couple of homes and left all the trees, when that's not really the choice you have. It's just not the choice. And, you know, I, I, this, this discussion we're having is, is the crux yep. of the plan, yep. and it's a good discussion. And I stood here, you know, many years ago having the same conversation with a different group of people, and it was the same yep. thing. It's like, how can you guarantee that, it is, that these are going to go in, in these places and not those places? And I would say I can't guarantee it. But the regulations you have right now are directing, are successfully directing the bulk of your development into your RC and your RB and now starting to go into the town center. Those are places that have public sewer, that have public water. For the most part, they have roads already. So it's more efficiently serving and providing municipal services with less impact on the tax base. Um, I would suggest that you know, all the people who bought homes in the Cottage Brook neighborhood would have been thrilled to buy two acre lots instead of the 7,500 square foot lots they bought. But they bought the two acre, they bought the 7,500 square foot lots because that was available. That's what, what the developer was willing to do. They bought lots that ended up on public water and public sewer with 40% of the space set aside. And, um, you know, it's hard to make the decision that you're only going to get this much land instead of two acres, but it's sure nice to have all that land behind you that no one's ever going to develop. So those are the choices you're being asked to make. And as the planner, I, I just need to point out to you that, you know, as you, as you reduce your capacity in the RC and in the RB, the pressure will build. Um, I'll just make one more comment. And, you know, when I did this before, I knew the town was getting older and, and I, 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 I knew that we needed to look at different types of housing and I knew that there were impacts from more seniors on municipal services, but the one thing I missed was the people who own the large lots of land are also getting older. And we see land changes when land transitions to other owners. So the Hillway property was developed after the property owner died. The East Meadows property was developed after the property owner died. The Maxwell Woods property was developed as part of an estate management. It's my expectation that there are other landowners out there that are in that senior category that there, we're gonna start seeing flips of property and changes are gonna happen. So last point, uh, so I appreciate your observations. Um, obviously, I also recognize it's the uh, Comprehensive Plan Committee's re um, recommendations, not necessarily yours. I nevertheless appreciate you defending them. Uh, and I would just note that's why we're here is we're all going to have different points of view and it's an opportunity to have a vigorous debate and try to nail down what's best for the town. So I, I definitely appreciate the, the viewpoint that you're bringing. So. Well, and I, I mean, I would just jump back into with a point I made at the outset of our first meeting last week which is the importance of chapters like this and the weight that the, the decisions that we come to and, and ultimately approve as part of chapters like this one are what is most critical when it comes time for these developments. And you hear people like Maureen just referenced with saying, oh, how can Maxwell Woods be being developed like that? Well, it's because the existing comp plan and ordinance support that kind of development and this is the time if people don't want to see a certain thing and I'm not singling that out and, or, or anything I'm just using it as an example but that the changes need to be incorporated now to support those things then as opposed to when a developer is sti you know sitting at the planning board meeting and saying here's my plan that conforms to all of your you know uh, comp plan direction and, and existing ordinances and, and well, I'm sorry that there's people in opposition to it, but there's nothing there's nothing that it doesn't conform to. So, anyway, that's that's my plug for people to get involved on these kinds of things now, as opposed to then. Anyway, staff to the planning board, thank you for that observation. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's you... no recommendations in this chapter. It's a data chapter. So, if you're ready, I can move on to the next one. Does anybody else have anything on this? 
Um, I, you know, on that last point, I will say I, I think this is one that we will want to uh, discuss a little bit further, probably, because um, I'm hearing some difference of opinion, obviously, and you know, we may we may get some additional input or opinion from from the public uh, generally. So, I, I go ahead. Have, I have, when we were talking about the um, the teardowns and rebuilds. Is there any data on uh, if any of them are multi-use or multi-family or in-law units where it would create like a new? Um... I honestly don't remember hearing one teardown that was actually a multi-unit. Okay. I think every Just single curious. one of them was single family. Okay. I'm getting a nod from that, here too. I think that's accurate. They've been mostly, if not all, single family residences that have been. Okay. The teardown phenomena. And if they weren't, would that data go in as um, a new unit? Would it show up as two units, or does it just show up as one? I, I would try to capture it. Um, we don't often see it. I mean, if you look at how we've been collecting data over the years, we've just started collecting data on accessory dwelling units. Not too long ago, we started collecting data, tear, taking out the teardowns as a separate piece. Um, you know, it's because we don't have that much development and we have, we now have a, a really good computerized database, it's not that hard to go back in the past. The last comp plan we had instituted the computerized building permit database, um, not in the entire 10 year period, so uh, piecing it together was a little painful. Uh, but yeah, we can do more now. Okay. Thanks. Recreation and open space. Sounds good. So, uh, probably shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that uh, residents in the public opinion survey ranked parks, open space, and trails as the highest rated town service. Um, love, love, love our open spaces. Um, right now we have 100, in 2006, what we do is we, we have tried to um, create a measure for our open space, as I've been talking about recommendations for the comp plan to have measurements. In the 2007 plan, we had 118 acres of town open space per 1,000 population. And that number is calculated based on land that the town owns, that it has easements on, that there is public access to. So lands for which we may have a conservation easement but the public is not allowed to go on it would not be included. Um, it's also lands that the land trust holds, that they have a public access easement. And we have to be, it's a lot harder to calculate than you would think because there is some cross ownership between the land trust and the town. So in 2006, we had 118 acres of open space per thousand. In 2017, we had 156 acres per thousand. So we are sustaining and or increasing our community standard of open space. Uh, the open space, the recreation and open space plan takes advantage of the management and greenbelt open space, management of greenbelt and open space plan that the town completed just a few years ago that is a very complete inventory. It has all our policies. We really looked at open space in a much more um, management focus. And so we're referencing that plan instead of just listing all the open space here. Uh, we This is the chapter that Fort Williams Park is in. We spend a significant amount of time talking about the park. Um, I was wondering if maybe you might want a little bit of update uh, based on the vote you took earlier this week um, on that section about parking. Um, I did want to point out on page 215, I know that when we were in the transportation chapter, there was, I think Councillor Devereaux had asked about traffic counts, and um, I believe the counts that you were referring to are in this chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and we put them in as part of the Fort Williams Park, there they are right there, uh, the Fort Williams Park conversation. So. Unless asked otherwise, I'm going to leave them here. Um, we have 24 miles of public trails. Of those 24 miles, 18 miles are town trails. So um, the town is absolutely the big player in town in terms of trails. We have a summary of those. 
Um, and then we look at the open space that the town owns and of the open space, 350 acres is open space that you are acquiring through planning board development review. So that kind of gives you a big focus on um, your land use regulations and how much of a player they are in your open space goals. Um, and then uh, we have a chart on page 225 on waterfront access because that's important to the state and important to the town and residents say that their reason for living in Cape is very closely tied to access to the ocean. Um, I'm gonna stop there and see if there's any questions. I wanted to ask a broad question about um, the comment that you opened with, that re and it's the first sentence of the narrative here, is that residents rank town parks, open space, and trails as the highest rate of local services. Was there any um, uh, sort of qualitative um, assessment of, so what that statement says to me is different from saying people want more. Page 226. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is uh, the results in this report are the same as the results. I think it's 226. Maybe it's changed a little bit. No, it's 226. Yes. Um, this is the same as what we found in the future open space preservation study, which is that uh, residents love, love, love their open space, but they're not so excited about spending more money to buy more open space. And uh, we have tried to be sensitive with the way this was dealt with. Um, you can see that um, if you look at this 10-year plan chart, uh, it's, it's not the leader. In, in expenditures, and there is there does seem to be a lot of satisfaction with the amount of open space we have. However, we are saying that when there is a specific property, um, there does seem to be a shift in how the public feels. So in the last comprehensive plan, there was a push by some parties for the town to do an open space bond, just a generic bond to buy land, and as you probably all know, that never happened. Um, this comprehensive plan isn't even recommending that. It's saying that you should be looking at taking advantage of opportunities. Okay. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, the, um, are you familiar with the Southwest Preserve of Fort Williams? It's the southwestern corner. Um, am I correct that that region of the park uh, is the one region of the park that is not uh, permanently protected from development? And I, I bring this up because if we, as a town, don't want to spend more money on open space, but we want to preserve what we have, it seems like one potential goal is that we permanently preserve all of Fort Williams from future development. So it, the permanently protected term is, is the one that gets you into the hole. Fair enough. Um, I would argue that the town of Cape Elizabeth owns the property, that there is very strong support by the residents of the community, that uh, Fort Williams is the jewel in the crown, that it's represented in open space plans, and that that is uh, better protection than anything else you could have because you own it. And I do know that there was a discussion um, more than 10 years ago about potentially putting an easement on it and handing that easement to a third party. Um, that was not well received in the end. Um, I will say as the planner that when you hand an easement on public property to a th private third party that is not accountable to the public the way the town council is, I'm not sure that's good public policy. But I'm not the one that has to make that decision. <laughs> Which area are you talking about, Chris? Uh, southwestern corner. It's the uh, undeveloped wooded area near the uh, little kid t-ball field uh, near the rental properties behind the... Oh, okay. So the hashed area on the bottom left. Got it. My vague recollection is most of the rest of the park has various overlays of some sort that prevent it from ever being developed, but that region remains open. Um, but as uh, Maureen notes, um, there would be a huge uproar if any town council tried to do it. Okay. 
So you asked the question about updating based on new circumstances. Well, I think there's that's obviously I mean, there's, necessary. It's, a, it's yeah. fairly easy for yeah. me to update that section that talks about it, it says that you're considering a pay display program and you've now approved a pay display program. So I can change those words to say that. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you'd like that update. There's a chart on page 225 that should really be a lot around the, around the area of page 223, and I will make that change. It's just awkwardly placed. Okay. So the recommendations are to promote open space preservation, retain town regulations that propose, promote open space preservation. So that would be retaining the cluster regulations, that would be retaining the open space impact fee requirements, um, continue to fund unique opportunities to preserve open space using a variety of methods. So that's the funding mechanism. It's a um, wait for a good opportunity and then consider if you want to do it. Um, strengthen the management program for the use of Fort Williams Park to prioritize the enjoyment by residents and balance the burden on municipal taxpayers, including increasing revenues from non-resident visitors. So that's a recommendation. And then there's a recommendation to continue to evaluate and adapt the community services program to meet the needs of the changing Cape Elizabeth population. I have so a question specifically on number 73. The last sentence of that line 20 on page 227, municipal funding should be contingent upon permanent public ownership such as a public access easement and public access rights. So I mean, there are instances where we use municipal funding but don't have public ownership. That's absolutely true. So is this contradictory to that or? Um, I don't believe it is. I, I, I get, do believe it's suggesting that your public easement rights should have more muscle. Jamie, are you thinking of like contributing to SELT? Yeah, it's, I guess what I'm asking is should it be or public access rights? So funding for things that either we're going to own or we're going to secure access to because not all cases do we own it and we might not for various reasons want to but <clears throat> I think the wording was changed by the committee to emphasize <laughs> more strength <laughs> I, I guess very specifically I feel like this this line of this paragraph is precluding us from municipally funding things that aren't things that we own. Right. I think there's a difference between public ownership and public access rights. I don't think you have to, I mean, there And there that's are, why I'm saying I think it should yeah. be, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's no. why I'm saying I think it should be or public access rights. So it's, it's contingent upon either acquiring the permanent ownership or establishing public rights. I can change that. I actually had flagged that as okay. something I thought was problematic as well for that reason. But my suggestion was going to be yeah. that we should make it a little less committal. Um, something more like the town may consider something like in, in providing municipal funding to preserve open space, the town should consider or may consider um, the establishment of permanent public ownership um, or public access rights, something like that, that leaves it open because I don't think we want to foreclose the opportunity to collaborate with SELT. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on this? I agree. I think um, Councilor Randos point is well taken. And to be clear, I, I mean, I, I don't want to limit it. I mean, SELT is the most prominent example, but there are other times when we, um, you know, acquire an easement or something over another pro private property owner's property, um, or, you know, Maureen, you could help me out. I mean, we've done land exchanges and things like that um, where mm -hmm. access is acquired without necessarily ownership. 
Go ahead, man. The, the, yeah, there are there are a number of examples across the community that uh, for Greenbelt access, for instance, into uh, Gullcrest off from Fowler Road. Uh, there's a couple of points there, as well as down on uh, on Two Lights Road, as well. We either either purchased it or had uh, found other mechanisms across public uh, across private property. I, I think the recommendation, though, is looking at the quality of the rights you obtain, not so much whether or not you own the property in fee. And in the examples you just gave, um, there's been no question about the town's public access rights over privately owned land, where there have been other instances where there's been serious questions and complaints about uh, unilateral changes made without the town having any involvement in those policy changes. I, I don't have a problem with the way the sentence was structured and why I was just looking up to see wh what you'd edited. I don't have a problem whatsoever with being forceful about the statement. I, I just literally think the difference between the word and and or locks us into ownership. Whereas or says, we might not own it, but we've acquired public rights to it. That's, that's my only point on that. I, I, don't, I don't mind, and it sounds like the committee was rather purposeful in the approach it took to this. I think they were. Go ahead. I think there were um, um, people on the committee who had a stronger view of that than others. Uh, because I, I truly am with uh, Valerie. I think we have to use May or something. And I'm not just saying for self, but uh, because I think this, this statement is a little too strong uh, because it could preclude us from um, uh, gaining access to certain parcels that might connect something. That's where you get into your trails and all of that. But, but there was a, uh, I guess, overall the committee, there were some that were strongly in favor of this and there were others that said it's a bit too strong. So but that's what ended up going forward. But I like Valerie's comment of May and I agree with the or. Other thoughts? You could even change it to um, or slash and if, if it's something that you want the and out of there. Um, just take out, take out the and completely. But I think that um, Penny and Valerie, I, I like the idea of changing it to may instead of a should. Chris, do you have any thoughts now? Oh, um, sorry. No, uh, I uh, distinctly recall a prior town councilor who um, very much was in favor of the idea of all uh, the land acquisition fund being used to acquire land owned by the town rather than easements. That um, view is what's reflected in the proposed language to some level. Um, and I do agree we need to keep our options open and what really matters is simply having an easement and an easement is a type of right. Um, so long as we're getting an easement, I'm fine with it being an easement rather than actual outright ownership. So um, it's the idea that the public has, we don't want to give money to people that the public then can't use the land. Mm -hmm. So, so long as the public can use the land, it should reflect that. Maureen, can you, uh, was this, I'm trying, I'm going back into discussions. Um, was this as a result of, and I don't always wanna keep bringing up Maxwell Woods, 
it wasn't. It didn't relate to not having access to a certain parcel that I, became You part. know, there may have been some comments given to the committee, but these words were not as a result of those comments. Okay, because good. that, uh, those, there were, let's just bring everybody into the discussion. <laughs> so under the current open space zoning regulations, um, the town allows people to set aside open space for an agricultural easement, for wildlife habitat, for greenbelt trails. And it says you must preserve it as open space, but you can still do things that are related to that use. So you can have open space set aside as a greenbelt trail, but you can still put a boardwalk on it. So there can be some impact if you want to have it as a wildlife preserve. You could still put a, an, a lookout on it so the public could observe the wildlife. And if it's an agricultural easement, you could still put accessory agricultural structures on the property because it's supposed to still be an agricultural easement. And I believe we did say that if it's an agricultural easement, the public does not have to be on the property, but if at any point it ceases to be an agricultural easement and becomes a regular open space easement, then there needs to be public access. So this does not, in my opinion, say you can't do that. But if you're concerned with the language, we can make some changes. Uh, that was a really good point, and I would encourage you to change the language to encompass that specifically the concept that uh, the transition from agricultural to non-agricultural, then the use becomes better. And the idea of critical wildlife habitat, you don't want people walking through it. But nevertheless, we would be willing to potentially contribute to preserve a critical wildlife habitat, even though the public can't use it in the sense of accessing it. So that's a good point. I think we'll move on from this, but I think the general feedback you have a good sense of yes, and good direction on. Okay. Could, could I point out yep. you received an email from Councillor Gabrielson, and this is the other place to talk about. He made a suggestion that town open space funds should not be used to purchase land in growth areas. And when you think about it, you would be taking your money to undermine your land use policy. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that said, if it's a critical wildlife habitat in a growth area, so I, I understand his viewpoint and I agree with it, but I just note the nuance, so I wouldn't want to completely. And, and I don't think that's a contradiction yeah. because even in the chapter it says that you know we're protecting critical resources with our resource protection zoning and the resource protection zoning is separate from the growth area. So is that something you want me to incorporate into this draft? What are people's thoughts? I mean, it seemed like a common sense thing that was his suggestion merely formalizes or codifies it. But it and it has come up in the past. Yeah. Can you cite an example? Or? Yeah, there was an example where um, the land trust was looking to buy property that was in an RB district. I spoke to them and expressed concern that that was undermining the town's growth uh, recommendations. Um, they did move ahead with it. In the end, it failed. The land was developed and additional land was developed. So it was a double fail. Uh, <laughs> um, as I think about this, uh, are there any spots where this would restrict us from continuing to develop the Crosstown Trail where, say, there's land that we would want to set aside or acquire because it allows us to continue to connect the various neighborhoods, but putting in a restriction like mm -hmm. Pose would, in effect, in effect handcuff us? Well, before you even answer, I, th I mean, I think that's what Jeremy has indicated with his comment here, that 
so basically make sure that it's consistent with other policy and goals. So if the policy is standing that you have a green belt that has full connectivity, then I guess what's the hierarchy of goals? It's, it's what we have to ultimately determine. But um, his note said, unless it's for the express purpose of connectivity as outlined in the green belt plan. But I, get, I mean, I, I think the interesting thing that this brings up is sort of, again, that master hierarchy of goals. <laughs> so that is there is there something that needs to be articulated, not just for this section, but for other sections too, that says, well, you know, in the case where there might be contradiction in this plan, <laughs> should it exist, then this supersedes that. I don't know. Or... Have we eliminated you know, I, all contradictions? I guess I can think about that and come back to you, yeah. but I've, I've seen people try to make the case that our cluster development provisions actually contradict other goals, and I've never seen it successfully made. Because if you look at our cluster development provisions, they very, very explicitly talk about Greenbelt Trail connections and preservation of open space and cluster development, and you have to really contort them to try to do what you're saying. Okay. Um, so 75 seems to go a bit to the point you were describing 10 or 15 minutes ago about the amount of generational turnover of large landholders. Um, is there, does anybody have a thought about being, I guess, more active on that? I, 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 don't, I don't know what. What would active be? Um, I don't know. I'm just, I, I mean, I just think, well, what does that dialogue look like today? I guess I'll, I'll start Pretty there. Pretty informal. Um, I, I can tell you that, I mean, you know that in the past couple of years, the Conservation Committee has been a lot more proactive in reaching out to property owners and talking about their goals and asking if those property owners want to work with them. And So that's different, I, I think, because you're, you're talking about... I, I guess what I'm trying to understand, um, and, and maybe it goes, this sort of, it, it sort of straddles existing use too. Um, so I, I think actually, I, my question is more rooted in that chapter, frankly, than it is for recreation and open space. Mm -hmm. um, but they're related and such that if we're looking forward 10 years, uh, 10 years plus, what level of active discussion is going on with some of those major landowners that are perhaps at a point generationally where there's a transition to occur? So, so that's, that's where my question is. If they should, come should in, should we be having a yeah, more they, proactive if, dialogue? If with they them? come in, obviously <coughs> we welcome them, we talk to them, and there are some landowners that have been hearing me talk for years about, you know, if I was in control of their property, what I would want. So, ha ha. Um, it's really very informal. Uh, and the only place where it's been formalized is where the Conservation Committee has said, you know what, we're really interested in this piece. We'd like to have a conversation. So other than that, it's more someone walks in, um, uh, sometimes the manager has conversations with people, but it tends to be initiated by the landowner. Is that fair, Matt? That's accurate. <clears throat> Definitely. Should, do, you, do you think the town should be more proactive in reaching out to some of those folks? I, you know, it's the delicate balance, obviously. You don't want to be presumptive or even offend somebody to say, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, but I think it's important to have positive relations with the landowners that they feel comfortable enough that they would want to you know, keep that atmosphere open, that they would feel comfortable to come and speak with you about that as they went, went along. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you want to respect their privacy and what their land, you know, what their long-term ethic may be, uh, because they're, you know, unless they have no heirs, uh, you don't want to jump, <laughs> you don't want to jump into that dynamic, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Uh, but also representing that, you know, respectfully that, you know, if they need to have that conversation, that you're open, open to have it. But you don't want to, you, know, you don't want to insert yourself into it. I guess be the way I look at it. 
Don't you think you kind of have ongoing dialogue with the, many of the? At the present time, right. yes, and I think Michael right. did before as well. Right. Uh, had you know, right. the most recent one that comes to example would be the Maxwell Woods uh, development. Uh, you know, as the assessor, I had conversations with the landowner. Uh, I know Michael had conversations with the property owners as well during that time period. So, uh, but it's being open to that conversation. You know, then know that they can come to talk to you about it uh, mm -hmm. has has worked. Uh, conversations with Spray Corporation over the years and how you know we're not from the assessing side of it, helping them uh, come up with long-term plans for how they can uh, both financially maintain their property and uh, in, enroll in certain state programs. Uh, when Morning was talking about 28% of the property be, uh, of the town being enrolled in current use programs, you're pretty much talking mm -hmm. about a couple thousand acres in the, in the south of the town. So uh, just trying to be helpful in that side of it. But uh, it's really being there and ready and able to have that conversation. Okay. Uh, I do think I remember that the future open space preservation committee held a public forum and specifically sent letters out to large landowners and uh, one they called and said why did you send me this letter and I was like well you know and um, some of them came to the forum and actually said it was nice to be asked so um, maybe you know we just try to have something very low level but along the lines of, you know, we value you, you know, come chat. That was 2013, right? Um, that sounds maybe around then, maybe yeah, a little earlier. Yeah. yeah. It feels like something that about once every 10 years or so we should be sort of having a, a coffee, coffee table chat about, I don't know. So, okay. I have a, Go ahead. I, in this chapter, we talk about um, Fort Williams being our most um, significant town open space, but we don't have anything in our goals about it. We have um, the one recommendation, and I was just thinking, do we want a goal in there of like to continue to preserve and maintain Fort Williams open spaces, recreational facilities for the enjoyment of residents, visitors? Do we want something like that, since it is such a big part of uh, Cape Elizabeth? I mean, that's that's an interesting question. We we didn't treat it as a separate goal. It's kind of under this goal one that we should be increasing our open space to maintain our standard, and then we have this um, recommendation number 74 that says that we should be managing Fort Williams, but we don't have a, a separate goal just for Fort Williams. Um, do we want to, and maybe we don't, but it just seems like since it's such a big part of Cape that it might be a goal in our comprehensive plan to continue to preserve it, maintain it. Uh, so what the, um, the not to speak for the Fort Williams Park Commission, but my, my impression when I was on it, um, so the Fort Williams Park uh, has its own master plan, um, which I felt that when we were on the Park Commission, we were really waiting for the comp plan to get wrapped up, because mm -hmm. then it was, okay, then we're gonna update the master plan. So I think everything you're referring to will eventually be uh, encompassed in the updated Fort Williams master plan, but I am hearing you about the fact that, well, shouldn't we say something about that? say something, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or at least reference yeah. that it's a goal to preserve and maintain it, um, because it seems that's, I would think it would be great to mention the master plan yeah, that's instead of strengthen the management program, you know, update or, or adopt a new master plan that does this. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, I, I think back to the sort of the guidelines and, and, and what Maureen set out in her introduction at our last meeting about these recommendations in particular being specifically actionable. Mm -hmm. So the broad objective of just preserving and maintaining I think maybe not quite as specific as let's let's get an update to the master plan and and, and um, you know act on any necessary um, components that come out of that um, Matt you were gonna add something oh, yeah. uh, I had two points council yep. straw very well uh, very well said my first one uh, which is uh, about the master plan and there is funding in the current budget as you as you may recall, as of Monday night, <laughs> has been approved to, to go forward with a new plan for or to begin that process. Second is the vision statement that the council approved regarding that, to, to that. So I think 
you know, with those two combined, I think you may eventually accomplish a, a clarification of where you want, where you may want to be as well. I, I think that's great. I was just thinking that we need to mention it in the comprehensive in the goals. plan since yeah. this is the comprehensive plan. So, you know, I think that's great. I think, yeah, that hits it pretty well. I'll finesse it a little more. Okay. <laughs> I guess, Maureen, one last thing on this, going back to the first question that kicked off our discussion about people saying how much they value the access, value the amount of open space. So the goal here is articulated in goal one is um, that the amount of space should be increased in order to preserve the standard, et cetera, et cetera. I feel like the goal the way it's currently worded skews a little too heavily towards increasing open space versus also consideration of um, enhancing the space that we might already have. So it's not necessarily about new open space acquisition, but um, whether it's maintenance, upkeep, preservation, enhancement, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Do you, do you would, follow where I'm going Would you with like that? me to massage that a little so it talks a little bit more about maintaining the open space? I, like I think it's just standard and both practically and optically a, a, a good way to recognize good. that there are some people who think the plan too aggressively reflects an acquisition strategy versus taking care of what we have or, or doing doing more with what we already have. That's, I guess, how That's I would one. gently put that. And then I think that also then dovetails and supports the notion of, you know, the efforts to protect, preserve, enhance Fort Williams, et cetera, et cetera. That's not about acquiring anything new. That's about improving something that we already have. Are we ready? All right. Wait, can we just take a very brief sure. break to stretch? Yep, go ahead. Uh, or I can just go. No, that's fine. Only other point that I would make about this is um, under, on page, 213 where it says the heading Fort Williams um, on number 10. I was just a little surprised that we didn't have more um, information about the importance of the park to the residents and its use. Uh, we seemed like we had quite a few paragraphs which were really fascinating from the historical society um, in other sections. So I was a little surprised that we didn't have something in here just talking about um, how important it is um, as part of Cape Elizabeth's character and how um, important it is to the residents. And maybe that's something our historical society can give us another little paragraph. It just seems that it didn't really talk much about its significance. and. Um, I would have liked to have seen just a little bit more on that. Any other, do you have any thoughts? I'm just looking back again through what is here. Pulling up the Fort Williams master plan, see if they have something that's written in there. Yeah, they could put something in. So we could just pull it from there. Yeah, because this. So it wouldn't necessarily have anything. Councillor Starr was just looking at the Fort Williams master plan to see if there was a paragraph we could pull. But it just seems that um, something about the importance of the park to the residents. Is that what you're after? I will, um, I'll do something, and if anybody wants to send any suggestions, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. yep. uh, so uh, 
Councillor Devereaux is pointing at the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, uh, Town Council policy statement from 1976 that's in the master plan. It's potentially something to incorporate. Okay, should we move on to future land use? Yeah. Can I just ask a dumb question here? And it may be that this is one of those where we follow the prescriptive outline of the state and all that kind of stuff, but why, does, why doesn't future land use come immediately after existing land use? <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I originally put the outline, but this is what the committee wanted. Okay. And, and honestly, I, I kept making that mistake and had to move it around too, because it made sense to me as well, but that's not what the committee had decided. So you can ask Penny, I guess. <laughs> so um, the future land use plan, uh, I think you all know that the, this is the one thing that I can send to the state and get them to review as a draft. And uh, we did do that and we got a comment back that that doesn't mean you can't make changes to it, but they only had two minor adjustments that they had questions about that I'm gonna address. Um, but you know, it's, it's kind of long. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here that is required by the state. It talks about every single zoning district. And remember, this is the, the legal underpinning for your zoning ordinance, so we wanna get all of this stuff in here. Um, it is the place where you officially designate your growth areas. And the last comprehensive plan, we probably could have done a little better job designating what exactly we meant. These are the districts that are growth areas. So it actually says, the rural area is the RA, the RP districts, the specialty districts, the growth area is the RC, the RB, the, B, the uh, town center, and the business A district. And it, it also talks about this municipal growth related capital investment, and I'm just mentioning that because you already know that uh, we have a little bit of work to do with um, the CIP document that the town has, and we're gonna have to make sure that uh, we're showing that where we're, where we're not maintaining and replacing infrastructure, that we're investing in areas mostly that are in growth areas. I don't think that will be too much of a problem just because the town center is a growth area and the schools are in the town center. So there's lots of opportunities for investment in those areas. Um, let's see, anything else that's kind of interesting about the future land use plan? Why do they have all these exclusions in the capital investment though? Are we talking about a particular page? 232, there's a paragraph on 232, line 26, municipal growth related capital investment does not include. Oh, that's from the state law. Yeah. What? And that's why I put it in there because you know, weren't gonna believe me if I told you. <laughs> Um, there, I mean, the state's philosophy is. Um, I guess that, the specific that thing that leaps they out want, is they they don't want you to promote sprawl. So what they want is they want you to identify your growth areas, and then they want your investment to go into your growth areas because that's where they want you to promote your growth to go. So we could invest in Mill Creek. Uh, no, I'm sorry. So this is this comes out of the state law. That's a great idea. <laughs> well, Maybe I'm or, or the Cape Elizabeth Town Center. Yes. <laughs> Maybe I'm misinterpreting. I, I guess mm -hmm. what I'm asking though is like, you you hear so frequently about. Um, infrastructure investment and talking about broadband and, and other things as a municipal and, and state and, and government infrastructure investment and then it's excluding that here as I read it mobile equipment and other and other and the like and I'm just I'm just trying to reconcile that if well I mean uh, if you're going to invest in a new tower I mean the, I don't think you're gonna have a problem with this because it's just one tower Although honestly, I mean, and, and this is covered under our wireless discussion and it's covered under the tower districts. All of the town's tower districts are far, far away from where the users are. And, and you know, that is part of the irony that you have all these people who want good cell phone coverage and then all your cell phone districts, all your, your overlay districts where you allow the towers to be developed are in your most sparsely portions of town. And, and you know, cell phone coverage just doesn't work very well that way. 
Right. And well, I, I, what I would add to that, though, is, and I think we've had a couple of discussions around tower districts and that kind of technology was sort of the first generation, and that technology has advanced quite a bit now, so that there's microcells and um, uh, uh, microgrids and things like that. Um, yes. There's a you know, there's a prominent company in Portland, a <laughs> high growth company in Portland that does exactly that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, but nevertheless, yeah. those I mean, we had someone who came into town a couple of years ago that was talking about using the small cell technology, and it was going to be a box. And my numbers aren't going to be exactly right because I'm not going to remember it. It was like five feet tall by two feet wide, and it was going to attach to a telephone pole. And the final conclusion was that it was still going to trigger planning board review. And um, we started getting letters from people opposed to it. And, you know, I think you as a group could say, look, maybe there are some ordinance provisions we should look at where we say that certain things have less review. You know, you, you, and I know that I brought this up, and I think, did I bring this up, Penny? Because either I'm imagining it. You're not that I, I, you know, that maybe you should, well, the town should be really looking hard at the newest round of wireless technology, and then if you want to encourage it, look at what your regulatory structure is, and maybe there's some opportunities to streamline. And I'm not saying to just open the door and let people do anything they want. Um, but if they're talking about doing a certain thing that you generally don't think is bad, you, you could write a rule that says if you want to install a box that's no greater than five foot by three foot and it's going to promote wireless improvements that all it requires is a building permit. Mm -hmm. But that's not in this, this document. I fundamentally agree with you, but given the amount of blowback that there was for CMP putting in wireless meters. <laughs> for them doing what? Uh, when CMP put in the wireless meters at people's houses, the amount of like acrimony that created. Uh, the idea, I, I totally hear where you're coming from and think it is probably a good idea, but nevertheless, like, I, I wouldn't touch it. So. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> You know, but I, I, I can come up with these all day that I don't have to adopt. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Uh, well, we kind of went off on a tangent, but Sorry. which is fine. Um, so the, the my question thing, had yeah, my original is, question had more to do with what I perceived as a contradiction in what you're saying is a state. You yeah, know, they, taken they, from state regulation they, they about want, excluding capital investment right. they for want, something I mean, that... If the town is going to invest in a sewer line, you should invest in a sewer line in a growth area before you invest in a sewer line in a rural area. That's that's some of the stuff this is talking about. You know, if you're going to create... if the I mean, if you're not Cape Elizabeth, if you're a different town, and you're going to invest in an industrial park, you should ha invest in an industrial park that's in a designated growth area. You need to think these th things through. Um, you know, if you're, I, I had some interesting conversations lately with uh, people who are trying to build affordable housing, and the struggle is that, you know, where we need the housing the most is where all the people are, but where all the people are is where it's most expensive, so they build the housing someplace else where there aren't that many people because it's less expensive. So that's what this is, is trying to say, is you really need to think through where your investments are. So, for example, there is a re recommendation in here to talk about extending sewer. Well, one of the sewer extensions was the Hampton Road neighborhood. It's an existing, developed neighborhood. It's a fairly compact neighborhood. It's right next to Great Pond. It's in the RA district. You could argue, well, it's an existing neighborhood and for resource protection purposes, we should be extending the sewer and that's going to be part of our 25%. Or you could say, this is a neighborhood that really bene would benefit from being in a different zoning district because it's in a zoning district right now where not one lot complies with any of the, the requirements. It's, it's an old RB that was put into an RA. So that's another way to deal with it. Um, the second sewer you talked about was the southern half of the BA district. That's a growth area. 
So that would not be a problem. There was discussion about potentially extending the sewer by, to in by the sea. In by the sea is in the BB district. That's a growth area. So these, these two of the three are, are actually growth areas. You know, if you look at East Mimenos, East Mimenos was built in the RB district. It's a growth area. The developer extended the sewer to that development. So that's consistent with the state policy. I just don't like that they're excluding mobile. <laughs> what, I get, what I'm getting to, but all right. All the school improvements count towards the growth area. Okay, um, so there's a summary of all the zoning districts, and I'm not going to go through those, but if, okay, or maybe I am. <laughs> I've been tilting at this windmill for a decade. Um, might as well go again. Uh, can we jump to the BA district? Uh, so, my, con my concern is the BA district, uh, we basically, we being the town council over the last decade, um, so let's go to the next page where we get to the commercial uses. Uh, yep, right there. So, um, basically, my perspective uh, is that the BA district, the approach that we took was that we are going to begin allowing uses into the commercial use uh, list that aren't necessarily consistent with a neighborhood business district, but instead match up with what is currently there. In particular, the... Um, the gas station with not more than two fuel dispensers. I'm unaware of any other residential uh, small neighborhood business district in Southern Maine that permits those. Uh, even uh, the business district on Route 1 in uh, Falmouth, back when I looked like five, six, seven years ago, didn't permit those. Uh, I'd note that that gas station, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, had some type of a leak or something in the past that caused one of the, the big multi-unit ap apartment building had to be evacuated. Um, mm -hmm. And they had to be put up somewhere because gas stations are simply not really compatible with directly adjacent uh, neighborhoods. So it was in there because there was a functioning gas station. There now no longer is. Uh, I think we should strike gas stations from the list for the BA district. Um, and I've been tilting at this windmill for a, uh, a decade, so <laughs> it is what it is. Okay. I assume you're talking about Cottage Road service station? Yep. Yeah. Which no longer has uh, uh, any fuel dispensers. They yeah. eliminated them. So the argument of keeping it in there because there's a pre existing use there no longer holds. Yeah. The, the only caution I would have is that there might be, I'm not sure, there might be some fueling at the Tamara landscaping facility on Ocean House Road. I'm not certain of that. But that wouldn't be that wouldn't be commercial. It would be for his own use, and that'd be separately permitted by uh, DP for your own. Uh, you know, he's probably got about if he has anything. He's got about that tank. From from the DEP permitting, it would be different. But from a land use, it might still be. It's a commercial district, and they have a station in there. I mean, it's not. And I'm not even sure they have it. I I think they might have it. Um, but, you know, this is a use that the council should think about. I mean, it's abs Mr. Excuse me, Councilor Straw is absolutely correct that when we write these lists of permitted uses, we tend to start with a list of everybody that's already there because there's no desire to force someone to be non-conforming. Um, and, you know, at any point you can start to tweak it, you can start to take things out, but I would just caution you that you know, if the owners of what used to be the Irving Station come in in two months and say, we absolutely have to pump gas or we're not going to be able to uh, sustain our business, are you going to be comfortable saying, too bad? Because, I mean, th that's fine. Well, okay. given that they removed the, the tanks, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a compatible use. Uh, with respect to Tamara, I'd note that wouldn't that then become a pre-existing non-conforming use so that they could continue to do it Absolutely. going forward. So I, it wouldn't I, force I only them bring to it shut up down. Because yeah. I know that yeah. um, in the past, councilors have been uncomfortable making existing uses non-conforming. I, I don't have a problem with it. Right. So I would recommend striking it. I don't think there's a justification to keep it. Um, it's incompatible with the neighborhood as far as I'm concerned. And the only reason it's in there is because there was a existing use, which is now shut down. 
Go ahead. I, I understand where you're going, Chris. Um, but I would also say that, say for example, they did want to put gas pumps back in there because they, if you look at the number of gas stations around, that there might be people in that neighborhood that would appreciate a quick stop to grab some gas on their way out of town. That's, I, I'm uncomfortable. Yep. Uh, moving it. Uh, so I'd note that we have two other gas stations right up the street. I understand uh, that. And Some court is solving all our problems. <laughs> <laughs> I'm turning into a NIMBY. I'm just going to be like, not in my backyard. That was beautiful. That and was great. My, my concern with having it as a permitted use is that someone could come in and turn the cookie jar into a gas station. They, if we sell the, uh, the fire station, they can turn the fire station into a gas station. And by making it a permitted use, any of those lots potentially can turn into a gas station where we have five gas stations in a row. And that's, that's the root of my concern. Okay, so let's say that, um, that the people who currently own that service station wanted to put gas pumps back in. Could they then do it if uh, under their current uh, use because they, they've taken them out so they can't really put them back in if we were to change this? That's true. Okay. I mean, if, if you discontinue, if a use is not permitted and you discontinue it and you want to start it up again, even though some people think you can, mm -hmm. you can't. Didn't they have more than two pumps? I thought it was two. I thought that's the reason it says two. Is yeah. No, we, we wrote it to, it, when this was written, we, we wrote it so that they could not come back and expand it to be bigger than it was. Right. So there were more Well, rules. this is smaller than it was. So they, they had four pumps. I know. Yeah. So, At the time, yeah. Yep. Got it. It was, it was more restrictive than what they had at the time, and, and the intent was that, well, I mean, you, you know, most people know that, that the Irving station decided to rehabilitate the entire station and blow it up with a lot more pumps than there were there originally and that's what kind of stirred everything up and that's why these <laughs> rules went in that said yes you could still have a gas station but it has to be a small one not like a route one gas station mm -hmm. I, I tend to agree with Councillor Straw I think that it needs to be removed it's do we really want um, gas stations and tanks and potential leaks in um, in that area? I, I just don't see it as viable for that area. When we do have other gas stations, do we want somebody who can come in and put in a gas station? And I'm not, again, I have no, no dog in this fight. It's just that the way that your zoning is written right now, you have two business A districts. One is on Shore Road and one is on Route 77 where the Bird Dog Roadhouse and the Good Table and the Kettle Cove Dairy are. And there have been multiple discussions about separating those out into two different districts and you haven't done it yet. So it, it, it would apply to more than one area, but um, I'm going to do whatever you want. Hold on, Councilor Randall. Could we just, would, would it be appropriate to put in something um, in the goals and recommendations to like review and consider revising business a district and and just like go for because it feels yeah, like yeah, yeah. very abrupt to change it here and without really thinking about it in a bigger sense. And that's exactly my concern is I, my concern is there's this, not to use the phrase feature creep, but basically we're codifying in these uses here where it, it's, it, if the detail was removed, I'd be comfortable with that because it, I am comfortable pushing this off to a further later discussion, but I'm not comfortable encoding these in the comp plan such mm -hmm. that it's like, well, now those are etched in the comp plan. How do you get them out now? So, and the question I had had was, um, so I had just heard through the grapevine that there had been some type of hazmat situation. So yeah, it was it, a while ago. Okay. But, but there was yeah. one, yeah. So, yeah. so the, the concern is know, a real one. But they're definitely, I, I believe, I wasn't involved, it was the code officer, but I, I think it was more that there was just gas roll, 
running down the road. Got it. But there definitely was some evacuation of the building. And Got it. So it is a re a re an actual concern rooted in reality. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to make the point, uh, excite a little bit more with Penny on this, um, where the incident notwithstanding, I mean, the business operated very successfully as a gas station for, I was just asking Matt, 40, 50, maybe even more, Penny, longer, longer than that. that. Um, market conditions changed so that it became economically not viable for them. Um, but I don't think it, I don't think their decision to pull the pumps really had much to do with um, neighborhood or community um, uh, opposition to them operating a gas station. It was just that it didn't make business sense for them anymore. So, um, is it likely that somebody else is going to come in there or knock down Kettle Cove Creamery and put in a gas station there if we're using both zones as an example? Probably not, but um, I, I, don't, I don't have a philosophical opposition to allowing for it if somebody wanted to, I guess is the point. I don't know. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, totally hear where you're coming from. Uh, from my perspective, it's the you take a step back with the zoning rules. And if the entire idea is it's supposed to be a small neighborhood community where you, you um, a district where you have uh, compatible uses, mm -hmm. and you look at the other uses uh, that are contemplated in that area where it's supposed to be like mixed use with some residential units above a uh, small office space or a coffee shop or whatnot, those are fundamentally, from my perspective, incompatible with the gas station. Um, and I totally hear you, it's been there, it was around for a while, it was business uh, business climate change. Well, I just want to be clear, I'm not, I'm not saying that's the way it's always been, so that's why we should keep it. I'm saying that for a great number of years, it was a perfectly compatible use, and um, it was other circumstances that led to the change in use, not, not all of a sudden, I don't think. And I, 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 I haven't heard opposition that maybe you have to it but I don't I don't think it it became an incompatible use in the eyes of the community more just a economically inviolable unviable one in I hear what you're saying the concern however is that by opening it up to a permitted use mm -hmm. additional ones can go in right. and someone could buy the cookie jar lot knock the building down people pass on and ownership changes and someone could put a gas station in uh, Irving wanted to come in, my understanding is, and put a nice modern gas station in. Two dispensers. <laughs> <laughs> Two dispensers, okay. Well, that's what they so, would be limited to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's the, uh, by making it a permitted use, any of those uh, lots in that district could be used as gas stations. I even just say a couple of things. Number one, that your biggest concern is to have that level of detail in here. The discussion around the ordinances it's themselves are a different event, yep. a, a different time. Mm -hmm. But if we have this detail in yep. here, it says that uh, we probably aren't going to be able to touch those ordinances exactly. because we have it yep. codified yep. in here. Yep. That's what I hear what yep. the essence of your yep. issue is. You hit the nail and on the head. and yep. so if we take the detail out, we can then have that discussion of the ordinances and maybe to Valerie's point, start looking at the uh, business aid districts and determine how we want to manage them differently. That's what I hear. Perfectly said. Yep. Okay. Yep. I can agree with that. <laughs> um, I had a separate question from gas stations on this on this section here, which was, you had alluded to the fact that, you know, you largely start the list by what's there, right, as just a starting point. Um, is this intended to be the finite list or no? no. And if so, you look so, at this last line here, and then I tried to give you some wiggle room. Uses, accessory to principal uses, and principal uses similar to allowed uses or otherwise compatible with the business aid districts 
may also be appropriate. And I put that in every single district. Okay. So the idea is I'm trying to give you a good, strong legal base for your regulations, but also trying to build in some flexibility. And okay. keep in mind, I mean, That's you, what, should, you where should be I doing stuck. it every month. Yeah. But if you wanted to adopt zoning that was basically inconsistent with your comprehensive plan, your planner should package that with an amendment to the comprehensive plan. And the town did do it when it first adopted its telecommunications overlay district because the comp plan said nothing about it. And so we, we wrote a section to the comp plan, a little data section, a little recommendation section, and it was adopted with the, comp, the town center, the, excuse me, the tower overlay district zoning changes. So you're, you should definitely be following this, but it's not like the door closes behind you. Yeah. There are some opportunities. Well, my reaction to it was that it focuses on a number of traditional businesses and industries, and I don't mean just traditional in in the sense of those that are there, but also just you know banking things like that. But you know, yeah. and I was concerned that it wasn't appropriately forward-looking enough to think of the types of businesses or uses that are going to be part of you know. The continually evolving economy, and, and I think that last statement and I know I, helps you grow. Yeah, and professional and business office, personal service, re village retail shop, all of those are pretty broad in their definition. I think so. I mean, they, they capture a lot of stuff. Um, but to be fair, I yeah. mean, the I mean, we talked about this at the very beginning that this plan basically says we're do we're on the right course, steady as you go, mm -hmm. and if you don't feel that's the case. This is the time to start saying we need to make changes. This section was written that our zoning districts seem to be working okay. And if you know we have a major problem with a district, now's the time to say something about it. Mm -hmm. Practically speaking, in the plan, what how would we do that? Where and how? In this chapter. Like I think that I mean it depends for example. You know, if you were concerned about, let's say, the 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 uh, RB district is not managing new growth the way you want it to, this would be the chapter to write that you know we're concerned about this and this and this in the RB district, and then the recommendation would say, review the RB district to address concerns with X, Y, and Z, and that's what the last comprehensive plan did. The last comprehensive plan said. You know, create an RBA, RB district that includes growth areas. Make sure it includes requirements for open space. Make sure it does this. So this plan is really a steady-as-you-go plan. And if you feel like they're, I mean, that's what your committee came to the conclusion. They, they looked at that, that a public opinion survey, and the public opinion survey said high, high levels of satisfaction. They didn't identify a lot of changes in, in course. Sorry. Is there something that you'd like to recommend or consider or come back to? Or I, I think I'd like to come back to it. Um, I just want to review some mm -hmm. things before. Okay. So if the town, um, if the town made a decision uh, and a zoning decision, you know, the zoning board or the planning board, and um, it was challenged in court, this would be the backup for, this is what the BA district was supposed to be about. Did, it does your ordinance, con, is your ordinance consistent with your comprehensive plan? And remember when I said consistent, it's not lockstep. It's like, are they both, you know, moving together? And this is a little bit uh, stronger foundation than the current plan. Go ahead, Matt. Maureen, if you don't mind me asking, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would the, would it, is it more difficult to add a use that 
is not identified versus deleting a use that is identified when you are looking at it being, you know, in the argument being consistent with the comprehensive plan when you're looking at altering think, a zoning I district? I think it really depends on what you're trying to do. <clears throat> so I'm looking at the highlighted language, and, and it's in every district. Uses that are accessory to principal uses, so that's pretty much, that's pretty wide. You know, you're, you're okay with the principal use, you can throw in on the, lots of little uses underneath it. Principal uses similar to allowed uses or otherwise compatible with the business A district or fill in the name district um, may also be appropriate. I think that gives you wide latitude and... For addition or deletion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think you you just want to be careful if you take something out, you you just say that, you know, we've decided that gas stations are incompatible with the neighborhood character of our business district. Should we continue on? Sure. So um, we have your future growth. So we're talking about future growth, and we've got that um, 120 units. Uh, we've gone over all these districts, and I think the last thing uh, I wanted to show you, because uh, it was controversial in front of the committee, although they, they left it in, and I think it addresses uh, a comment that uh, Councillor Straw made early last week, was um, the impacts of low growth. And I just want to make sure that uh, the committee understands that while I know that there are many people who like the idea that there will not be any more development in Cape Elizabeth, there are consequences to that. And this report tries to address that. So we talk about um, the 10-year plan, 120 units. Uh, potential problems with the RA district or not. Uh, and then the low growth impacts are as follows, and the number one is affordable housing. Um, and I think you, you all know that, that if the assessor uh, in his report to the committee um, said that, you know, medium sale prices for, affordable, for homes in Cape Elizabeth is now half a million dollars and that the lack of affordable housing is impacting the ability of seniors in our existing housing to be able to transition into other types of housing and then make those existing homes available to new families. Uh, it's also probably contributing to the decrease in school-aged children and it's probably impacting workforce housing, which is uh, gonna have an impact on the ability to attract municipal employees that live in the town, and it's gonna impact your volunteer services because you're gonna have fewer people who are here. And you know, one of the examples of that is probably the fire department, which has other issues, but you can probably look at other, other areas where you're gonna have that. Um, under demographics, when you have a community where people want to stay in the community but they can't afford to transition into any other housing, then you're not having that churn of new people. And there is a benefit to having uh, new people moving in. The other question is, again, this falling student enrollment. I think you recognize that there could be a greater swing in seasonal population. And also, we're, we're gonna have more housing that's owned by non-residents. And non-residents, um, generally are people who don't necessarily have the same commitment to community, to the values of the community, as the people who live here all the time. And then finally, it's municipal costs, because there's a certain amount of um, expectation that new development is gonna generate new, uh, new revenue that's gonna cover new costs, and when you have your development depressed as much as it could be, um, you're not gonna have any more generating new revenue. You're just gonna have to have the existing property owners continue to pay for things. And there could be a point where they say, we're not willing to pay for more. So it's, it's just important when we're looking at development and we're looking at the amount of development, you know, how much is too much, but there could also be too little. So that's pretty much all I have in this chapter, except for um, the recommendations. Can I ask a question? This may Certainly. be a really silly question. On um, 
247, I'm, I'm going back to the concept of, of uh, getting our communication and, um, you know, broadband wireless uh, uh, communication to the level it needs to be. Is it odd to think that you might designate your telephone poles tower overlays? I'm suggesting that if you are not satisfied with the current ex expansion of wireless, that you may want to take another look at other opportunities and you don't have to come up with the answer in this comprehensive plan. You could mm -hmm. make a recommendation that just says, we need to look at this again. Yeah, and we have, we have that in here as a recommendation. I didn't know if there was a nuance within the tower overlay that could kind of uh, I would chew I that think up. I would recommend you have a broader recommendation that says look at your tower overlay district, see if there's ways that you can increase communications instead of saying, unless you've, you've done a lot of work on it and you know this is the thing. Okay. I mean, if the town had experienced situations where people had come to town, asked to put these things in, problems had occurred, then you would have had enough, uh, you know, information gathering to maybe make a more specific recommendation. Okay, great, thank you. Do you want to go over the recommendations? Okay, so again, some of these are to address uh, state goals. Continue to administer and amend land use regulations. This is another one that steady, steady goes. We're pretty much going to continue doing the same thing. Uh, manage an efficient development review and permit procedure process. This pretty much is a state requirement. There were some people that didn't like it, but I don't really think it promotes bad things. It just says, you know, good government. Um, 79, review the regulation can, of existing non-conforming lots. You, yes. You, it's, it's a, there's some people that know, I assume people that are saying the process is too slow, it's no, too cumbersome. No, the other way. No. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Why do we want development review to be efficient? We want it to be painful. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Um, and then we should talk about 79. Review the regulation of existing non-conforming lots and fill lots and recommend ordinance revisions that allow non-conforming lots a reasonable opportunity to be built upon and or buildings expanded to meet the needs of modern households while protecting the character of neighborhoods. So despite the way this is worded, I tended to think of this as more of the recommendation to look at setback requirements for non-conforming lots and that the other recommendation that you talked about last week was the expand the uh, opportunity of people who have non-conforming lots to build on them when they can't build them now. Okay. Keep going. Number 80. Uh, number 80 is undertake a housing diversity study. So this is really a heavy lift to have a meaningful look at the housing costs, the housing needs, the impacts on services because we don't have affordable housing, relevant elements and actions to create more affordable opportunities for seniors to downsize, for young adults and young families to move to Cape Elizabeth, and a minimum options to evaluate should include incentives to create permanently affordable housing and municipal purchase of land for construction of affordable housing. So this is a really substantial recommendation to not just do a study and say we should do it that we should have more affordable housing, but to really look at meaningful recommendations. This will have a cost. Gonna have to pay for this to be done. Okay. Shall we keep going? So I'm okay with it just because it has the word evaluate, but I'm not in favor of the municipal purchase of land for construction of affordable housing. It's uh, the market should handle that. I'm fine with it as is, so it says evaluate. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to take that out as a group? I'm fine with keeping it as is, just because it says evaluate. It doesn't say do it, but. Okay. 80, 81, initiate a charter change this to require. Be, I, I'm sorry, as yeah. I'm reading it more clearly. This would be just another example. <laughs> I think the difference between the word and and or is interesting <laughs> um, because not only are we talking about incentives to create permanently affordable housing, which I think is something that probably makes sense. Yeah. It's the 
it's the and purchase which leaves people questioning. So um, anyway, that's that's the distinction I draw there. Do you want that out? I, I, again, I, I think I, I'm not opposed to keeping it on the table, but it, when when the clauses of the sentence are conjoined with and, it makes it sound like. Do you want me to take and replace it with such as, but not limited to? Sure. Mm -hmm. it, it's all these instances like this where we're saying A is predicated upon B, or well, B in this case is predicated upon A, then it makes it sound like you can't do one without the other. Eighty-one. Charter change. I believe you've already done that. No, actually, that's not a charter change. That's just you have an ordinance change. Um, Eighty-two. So, is, are you right? It's the recommendation. The recommendation of the committee is to, to have a charter change. To have a charter change. Yes. Okay. So, I mean. I think what you had was um, a vote to amend your ordinance mm -hmm. rather than a charter change. Mm -hmm. 82. Can, can you enlighten us on some of that discussion? Let's just keep moving on. I, I, honestly, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with what that discussion. No, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the committee there was, pushing there, to. There was a deep concern with uh, a simple majority of the council being able to dispose of public. Totally rights. understand. I'm not. I'm not. So what? What I'm curious about is the discussion that took place at the committee to say what has been done isn't strong enough. And oh, this no, is no, what no, 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 we hadn't no, done, we hadn't this done was, anything. Oh, okay. yeah, this, was, this was approved in December of 20. So I guess my question is, in light of the fact that the ordinance was passed, as yes. it was, is it still the recommendation of the committee that this should advance to a charter change, or? The committee has not met since yeah. the council made that, that choice, uh, that uh, decision, so I could not speak to what the committee would want. I think this is something worth revisiting in some way, but go ahead, Valerie. Um, I think that could become problematic if we're also purchasing land for construction of affordable housing, because if we're, as, as recommended in 80, I think the intent was more for um, access to the water and nature and things like that, but um, yeah, so maybe. Well, 81 isn't about purchasing, it's about relinquishing. But 80 is about purchasing. Right, so you're saying that if, we're, if we only need a majority to purchase something, or no, I'm not following what you're saying. But if you purchased it with the intent for affordable housing, I'm, I'm not sure that you would have to be in auto compliance with the recommendation in 81. Yeah, I just think we may not want to, um, I, don't, I, I don't think a charter change is necessary, but we may want to revisit the whole question with the committee, both based on- Oh, they're done. It's, up, it's all yours now. <clears throat> If I may, yep. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, that's problematic uh, as it's written uh, for any real property uh, because you may foreclose on a property uh, for lack of paying property taxes and then you own it for good unless you get a supermajority at that point to, to, to release it. To dis literally, you're disposing of it if, if it's gone to that point. I mean, it's, this is 200% beyond what you did back in December. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think Matt's brought up, we're, we're talking about two separate things. So number one is this is very broadly worded. The ordinance that we changed previously was very specific to uh, points of shore, shore and ocean access and all that kind of stuff. This is very broadly worded about any property. There's no qualification of this, number right. one. Um, is that, are, are we correctly interpreting the intent? Yes. Chris? I, I, I apologize that I'm over here chuckling, uh, but I just do want to also call attention to the fact that many of these other provisions, I've kind of uh, bit my tongue 
Um, but they often will say evaluate or consider. This one doesn't say that, it just says do it. So I just wanted to point out the, uh, that nuance. Um, but like you said, uh, this is saying do it, and as you noted, it isn't just if it provides indirect access to the water, it's any land whatsoever. So if we wanted to get, arguably, if we're giving out an easement to cross a parking lot to an adjacent property, is that giving away uh, municipal real property if we hand out an easement? So, so Maureen, the process for when we um, identify something that has been recommended by the committee, if we see that there are uh, challenges or flaws within the um, the recommendation because it there's uh, it creates conflict in other parts of the plan. Is it then the council can say this this is in conflict? It it isn't. Um, really going to work out the Councilor way it was Jordan, intended? You don't even have to have a good reason. Okay. They're an advisory committee. They've provided you with a document. You get to amend the document as you <coughs> see fit. You don't have to decide that it's vague or anything. You can just say, I don't agree with this. Mm -hmm. And you can take it out and you know, I'm charged with showing all of these changes and then you're gonna be holding a public hearing in June and July so that mm -hmm. if any member of the public or any member of the committee can then, you know, come to that public hearing and say, we like your changes or we don't like your changes. But mm -hmm. you don't have to have a good, a good reason. Okay. You can just amend it. Okay, perfect. I don't like these changes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, you all heard. I was the lone dissenting vote on that on that motion. Um, I, the notion of supermajority, I think, is uh, something that I'm just so, philosophically opposed to. So we can we can say that we aren't we are going to strike this recommendation. Um, the thing is, it's, it was put in there at a time when we were having conversation about an, uh, an issue along the shoreline and agreements were being made or perceived to be made by the council uh, relative to shoreland property, which is now uh, being handled in a whole different way. And that's fine. I mean, when we, when we were dealing with that specific issue and that motion that was before us, um, you know, I made the comment that if, if the people that were proponents of that action mm -hmm. really wanted to see meaningful change, that a change to the charter made more sense, even though I'm, again, philosophically opposed to the idea of a supermajority vote for things like that. Um, this takes it a step further to be, right, to be everything. far more broadly, which even increases my opposition to it. But Which says um, that we, as a, a team, a council, can say we're, we're not going to include that recommendation because it's... Well, if that's... Right. We can do that. If that's what the majority opinion is. Though, right. But, so. so we can put that forward. So as it's written, I don't... I, I think it should be removed as it's written or at a minimum altered because uh, it doesn't include a provision such as um, or a majority can send it to the voters to have the voters authorize it. It doesn't mm -hmm. even have anything like that. So it, as it's written, it's the you have to have a super majority or end of story is how I understand what it's saying. It doesn't have to or send it to the voters using majority. Council Straw, just as you can delete it, you could amend it. Yep. It could say, you know, you could qualify it at the extent you want to qualify it. And the other is to the extent I were to qualify it, it would be or a majority would consent it to the voters, but then also I, uh, we had some provision involving if it's something over, I'm trying to look at the charter here and find it, the over a million dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Having something like that in conjunction with it, then it's, you're harmonizing it with the other involving the purchase of an asset. We're saying both a purchase and a disposition valued over a million go to the voters, and that makes sense. But having it be all where it's like even a small easement, that, yeah, then it's too broad. Right. So I don't know if that helps. The, the, this I mean, you could also change this to say to, you know, have a community community review the charter for updates and amendments, including but not limited to 
supermajority to purchase and dispose of land, referenda, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. like um, I would be in favor of removing it entirely, but given that it is something that the committee expressed was important, and I think a lot of people consider it to be important, put in something in the recreation and open space goals that just notes something about shoreline access or some, something like that that I think was behind this. Well, that, I, I again just want to clarify and go back to my previous question was, because I think what I heard Penny saying was the genesis of this conversation was the very specific and more narrowly focused issue. I'm curious how it grew to it, be as broad as it, it morphed into. Yeah. It morphed. I, I would just love to hear more about that. It morphed into things like, um, well, you know, they could sell land in uh, Fort Williams. Um, you know, the the council could approve some land sale within Fort Williams, and uh, somebody could build something on there or whatever, or. Um, I, other town-owned land, um, whether it be a, a building or whatever. So then it just morphed into this whole conversation about possibilities, not realities. That's that's the way I interpret it. What do you? I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> it morphed into a conversation. I would recommend because there is a. There is a sizable, oh, use my words carefully. There is a, uh, there is a subset of the community that probably does feel strongly about this. Um, I would recommend that we do what, along what the lines of what the town planner suggested, turn it into, instead of do this, let's make, turn it into a consider. But I would, um, maybe we leave it that vague, but as part of that consider, what I would do is I would simply harmonize it with the existing rever referendum requirement for purchases over a million to also then make it also dispositions over a million. And then if that cover, I mean, that, that covers much of this. The concern about all the Southwest Preserve of Fort Williams can be disposed of by a vote of the town council. It, that's, I think, also captured in this. That's also then dealt with if instead it's review it and then harmonize it so anything over a million dollars has to go to the voters for a disposition. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how often, I can't imagine any time we've ever disposed of anything that <laughs> so, so aside the obvious issue, but uh, any time <laughs> that there was an actual uh, completely um, uh, uh, followed through with disposition of anything worth over a million. Maybe you can think of something that I can't, but. Having it just review and consider, I think, is what I'd be asking. It looks like this is one that we're going to have further discussion on. I'd probably not reach unanimous agreement on it. Exactly. So that's fine. But. So I'll work on something that talks about a more generic review of the charter. Is that the consensus of the group or not? Yeah, yes. I'm seeing two nods. Yes. I'm seeing <laughs> wrinkled brows. <laughs> Generic, but at the same time, I also do think we should pay lip service to the recommendation so that we shouldn't completely neuter it and remove the reference that they made. Do you, do you get the, get what I'm uh, let, me, let me try to yeah, do something it. with it, and you'll, you can see it next month, next okay. week, next week, except you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 82. This is a requirement basically to deal with the state comp plan rule, ensure adequate training and support for the code enforcement officer. I say you're really throwing shade on Ben there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tried not to put them in, then I imagined doing the checklist and I just gritted my teeth. 
Um, 83 is actually a recommendation from the code officer and it relates to short-term rentals and his experience has been that it would be easier for him to track what's happening with them if everybody had to get a permit. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really increase the rules. The people who have to meet rules now would still have to. It's just everybody would have to get a permit because we have people now that are like, oh, I'm only renting it for two weeks a year. And it's like, well, it's been out there for six months. Or, oh, I don't have it. I'm, I'm, my my in-laws are staying there. And it's like, well, it's still online. Oh, well, I changed my mind. So this, this is an actual land use recommendation change that you could implement. And then, Can I ask a question related oh, to that issue? Certainly. Um, I know in all the discussion of the various um, you know, consideration of short-term rental ordinance in South Portland, there's been, um, I think, a nod to, with this growing industry, I believe that there are some entities that sort of do oversight or yes. some like clearing houses, if you will. Of, yes. are, are we using those? Or, no, no, and I, I keep hinting, but South Portland has um, hired a professional company who will track the short-term rentals, report the permits to you, and I've, as the planner have hinted, hey, we, sh we should go with them, but there is a cost involved, and um, there hasn't really been an interest um, that I'm not the one doing the enforcement. It really needs to be someone like the code officer saying, yeah, I'm interested in doing that. Okay. I would say that, again, that sounds like something that South Portland's doing it. Maybe we say, hey, you guys want to go in on this together? <laughs> Um, anyway, and that's, that's, South Portland Portland that's not something you would actually have right. to put in a comp plan. You could so just maybe you and Ben can explore that. Something. Yeah, the, yeah. The name of the company that I've, I've spoken with yeah. in the past is called Host Compliance. Yeah, that's what I've heard. And, yeah. yeah, and they're great. Yeah. Uh, it's just a question of yeah, if we, it's an opportunity for, uh, like looking at the next chapter, yeah. collaboration between yeah. municipalities, definitely so, because okay. there's such crossover between. South between Portland's us. also putting in cannabis stores. Maybe we should do that. <laughs> No, no comment, Councilor. <laughs> and then the second goal, um, it was really more of a catch-all, but we just said the town should position itself to be ready for energy technology innovations. And one is incorporate renewable energy into town facility capital investments and educate the public about the benefits of renewable energy. And then second one, install an electric vehicle charging station. Comments? I don't disagree with the recommendation. I it just it it seemed kind of hanging out there. Well, it, it, it's it's not necessarily land use per se. I mean, who am I to tell a comprehensive land committee what to uh, do? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's fair enough. And aren't we doing eighty-five already? I thought we like applied for something. Or? Yeah, well, we, uh, we almost got rid of one. So. <laughs> We're going to add another one, so you're going to be up to uh, a few more. You ready? Yeah, we were doing so well on time for so long there, and now we're right back on our original schedule. <laughs> okay, so I think the last chapter that's on your task for tonight is the regional coordination program. And um, the town has, a, I think, a long and a proud history of coordinating with other communities. Uh, you're currently engaging in many regional coordination activities and you're proposing to continue to take advantage of opportunities as they arise for regional coordination. So um, there was a summary of everything you're doing right now and the regional coordination goals, which are on page 258, state um, one, that you should evaluate the needs of the fire station services in Cape Elizabeth with a focus on if the Cape Cottage fire station is needed and look to other towns to share resources based on International Organization for Standardization Standards. Uh, and then the second recommendation is to pursue opportunities to partner with other communities to provide public services in an efficient, cost-effective, and comprehensive manner. Particular attention should be paid to public safety, public education, public works, including sewer maintenance and library services. Thoughts? On 87, I know it's not a finite thing, but I mean, I, I would 
I would broadly include other administrative services, you know, other municipal administrative services. <clears throat> I mean, as Jim, yep. I, I agree with you completely. I mean, we've been, we've had had a history of that as well. Uh, case in point, myself yep. uh, as the assessor for, for both towns. So uh, I think we're, you know, in many ways, we'll be looking at having to do these either by choice or by force, uh, just due to the changing work uh, workforce uh, that we're all facing. So uh, these are both great recommendations, at least from the manager's side. To, to work on implementing and working with the council in the years to come. Any other comments, questions? Um, just one yep. comment. Um, does this sort of include, I know this is really something that is unlikely to happen, but I'm a huge proponent of um, public transportation. Um, and we did have a little note in the transportation goals about evaluating the need, desire, and local financial support for expanding public transit options in Cape Elizabeth. Do we want to also include something about that in here to maybe link it to looking at regional cooperation for that? Do we need to? Does anyone, is anyone else interested in that? I would just love to be able to take the bus to work so I can read. <laughs> I, I agree, and I have my... Metro car right here. Uh, I'm I'm on the uh, PAX uh, transit long-term um, vision, yep. the transportation committee right now, looking at um, Southern Maine's vision for transportation. And we're partnering with um, South Portland and other communities. I think it's really important that we we look at this and we talk more about um, transportation, public transportation, especially with our seniors and. Our community is changing. We need more um, uh, availability for seniors and other people to get around. It's important. Yes. Uh, uh, in the interest of saying it once, saying it well in one place, I would ask that I could go back and look at the transportation recommendation and maybe beef it up a little bit rather than adding another one here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like a note about, you know, look at regional mm -hmm. coordination options, something like that. Okay, okay. The other thing, um, and I can't remember, since we're not in that chapter right now, specifically all the wording in the transportation section, but um, I mean, this is something that GP COG is looking very, very closely at actively right now, too. We hosted a night here, I don't know, six, January. six yeah, yeah, eight weeks ago. Um, where it was a regional get together, one of many that they had had throughout the region, sort of um, uh, qualitatively taking the pulse on what communities' needs were and desires were around transportation. So it's something that they're actively involved in too. So, um, and I know hoping to make some more specific tactical recommendations about. So, uh, if I may, yeah, I'm on the I'm the chairman of the TIP committee. Transportation Improvement Policy Committee, I think is what it's called. I get caught up in all these darn acronyms, quite frankly. And PAX has one for everything, mm -hmm. as Councilor Deborah knows. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with you about this or, or any, any council member or try to get them to come in and talk about and give us another follow up on it because the battle rages on would be the best way I could put it to try to get collaboration, coordination with working with Metro, South Portland Bus Service, uh, Shuttle Bus Zoom, uh, RTP. Oh my gosh, to try to get them to work together just, just to get an app, to have coordinated schedules to, I mean, RTP I think right now is about to spend four and a half million dollars on a, on a repair facility where they're currently doing it at Metro because they, they want to have their own. So it was, I, I had this discussion, I don't know if it was this week or last week, but just watching that conversation unfold and there was a large forum of uh, this is the annual retreat that I went to back in September and you know not being in that industry uh, one thing I said is it'd be great if you know you could go from let's say Knightville to to the eastern prom in Portland and not get there in three times the amount of time it takes you to walk it 
and it does. It takes an hour and a half to get from Reds to the Eastern Prom or to GP Cog because Sarah is a graphist who works for PAX. Is there? She's like, I could walk it faster, and that does not make sense whatsoever. And I made that comment, and then another lady came in later. She was late to the party, and she was another, you know, another citizen involvement invited person, and she made the same exact comment. It's like, okay, uh, guys, we need to work better at this. So it's it's a live action thing that you know the the region is working on, but sometimes it's like. You've got to put saddles on folks and just drag them to get there. And <laughs> it's a huge. It's. I feel like I, I really my forehead's gone up three inches just by slapping it, trying to get through. It's. They've got to get there, and then the electeds and the appointeds are working on it. And but wow, is it painful? But uh, I, I guess that's my long-winded way of saying I couldn't agree with you more. And to try to find a solution to that before. I need to ride the bus on a permanent basis would be great. Anyone else with anything for this before we wrap up? I do. Yep. Um, so you have another meeting next week. I think you're in the list of things that you're going to be covering. Uh, but I just wanted to give you an update that your original plan was to have a public hearing on June 8th. No. Yes. On yeah. June 10th, and then um, on, then have a vote on July 8th. And Deb Lane, the clerk, and I have been reviewing the rules that the state has, and you need to give a 30-day notice for your public hearing. So what we're suggesting is that you stick to exactly the same schedule you have, but that you also have a public hearing on July 8th. So you have your public hearing on June 10th because there's not enough time between now and June 10th to have a 30-day notice. And then you would also have a public hearing on July 8th, which gives us plenty of time to get you your 30-day notice. And you could still vote at your July 8th meeting. Okay. And that's more of a courtesy to let you know what's going on. Uh, so I'll work on revisions. Uh, I would say if there's anybody who um, is interested in suggesting additional language, please feel free to just send it to me because everything is going to go on the document and, you know, it won't be secret. Everybody will see it. Mm -hmm. Anybody have anything else? All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, have a great vacation. Thanks.